It's not, isn't it? Oh, no, it wasn't. It Sorry. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> regular open meeting of United Laguna Woods Mutual Board of Directors, California Nonprofit Mutual Benefit Corporation. Today is Tuesday, September 11th, and we are in the boardroom of the community center. Uh, we have a quorum because all of our board members are here. Thank you. <clears throat> and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will call on uh, Director English. Good morning. Before we have the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, I'd like us all to stand up and in silence and honor all the people that were killed on 9-11. All the people from the towers, from the Pentagon, and from Flight 83, and then all the people that have subsequently become uh, a problem, have it getting cancer and everything else. We need to honor all of them and all of the relatives and friends of theirs. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is the media here yet? I don't see her at the moment. <coughs> Uh, but we are being filmed uh, uh, live upstairs on TV, so we do have some media that's <clears throat> here for us. Uh, <clears throat> the approval of the agenda. We have uh, three addendums to the agenda, uh, and they are for items 13A, 13B, 13C, and 14F, and there were some wording changes to the resolutions. Uh, so, uh, if you have not picked those up, all of the board should have them at their uh, place, but there are extra copies over there. Uh, the items were already on the agenda, it's just that there was some information <clears throat> that needed to be added that was not there when the agenda was prepared. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to add a 13J to the agenda. Early release of funds for the Wasteland Remediation Program. Is that J? Sorry. 13J. All right. Sorry, I thought I got them all. Okay. Is there a second to the approval of the agenda? All right. Any discussion? All right. Without objection, the agenda is approved as uh, amended. All right, let's look at the meeting minutes, and we have two. We have one for our regular open session on August 14th, and then we also have the minutes of the April August 17th um, special open meeting, which was meet the candidates. Uh, let's try to do them both at once. Can I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes? Cash and Jamie? Five B. My name was omit omitted from the member present. I think I was there. All righty. <clears throat> yes, Carl. Uh, as I stated in my email this weekend, I think that the information that Mary Stone had provided. Okay. I, the whole PowerPoint presentation. I have no objection to that. Is there any objection from the board to put in the PowerPoint presentation that Mary Stone gave on VMS last week? Right. Last right. Month. I mean last month. Thank you very much. All right. We will direct the <clears throat> secretary to do that. Um, Andre? 
this uh, uh, procedure on the screen, we don't have it yet. All right. We don't have the agenda. We don't have anything yet. Did you push the button over on the left that says agendas? Oh, it, yeah. Uh, it's, it's highlighted. Click the button. That there, says we there we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Well. Oh, okay. And then hit United. Well, then it goes back. Okay. Nothing. Just mm -hmm. agenda. View, you're right. View. It goes back. Yeah, I have so it on paper. So you can request this. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, so there's no more <coughs> electronic uh, agenda on the screen. No, it's it's in your package. If you want it up there, I'll have to have Chuck come down and okay. fix it. But you have the paper copy. Yeah. I don't think. I can't get mine. Same I, take. I can't get it either. <laughs> okay. Wonderful technology. Go back to <coughs> right. Uh, and I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see if we can use voting mode if, since it's not showing. I think we'll just have to do things manually today, but that's fine. Well, I think. All right. Are there any objections to the minutes of those two meetings? If not, they're approved without objection. Okay. Uh, report of the chair. Uh, we had five agenda items that we worked on last month that went to a 30-day review. There was not 30 days between the August and September meetings, and so we are calling a special meeting, open board meeting, on Wednesday, uh, September 26th, just to, to take care of these items, because we normally do not have a business meeting in October. In October is our annual meeting, and so we'd like to get these done since they will have completed their 30 days by then. So uh, anybody that wants to is invited, and they are the five items <clears throat> that uh, we went over last month and went out to 30-day notice. Okay, uh, I'd also like to recognize that this is the last regular board meeting for Directors English and Tibbetts, and we will miss them greatly. Uh, sorry to see them go, but we hope that we will see them on a future board. Oh, we will see them next month. Well, they'll be at the annual meeting, yeah. but it's not a business meeting. This is their last business meeting. <coughs> All right, <clears throat> now we go to open forum, <clears throat> and this is the opportunity for residents who are in the audience to speak. You have three minutes, and it should be something that is not on the agenda. If it's on the agenda, you will have an opportunity to speak when we get to that agenda item, and you can speak only once. <clears throat> All right, is there any... Anybody who's turned in a card, Cheryl? Yeah, our first speaker is Steve Leonard. <clears throat> Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Steve Leonard. Uh, What's second Tuesday? <clears throat> Is the mic on? No. Check, 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 check. Can they hear me upstairs? There you go. There you go. Okay, shall we start again? Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stephen Leonard, Avenida Sevilla. Good morning, Madam Chair, directors, VMS staff, and fellow United residents. I have two issues regarding board member conduct and an appeal regarding our current mutual elections. First, a current United board member has taken to the next door social media platform to continually criticize and post negative remarks about the United board, fellow board members, and village management services. This director repeatedly states the United board puts the interests of the corporation and those of VMS above the interests of the residents. This divisive conduct would certainly appear to be a violation of the United Mutual Directors Code of Conduct. Secondly, 
Some United directors appear to be participating in what may be considered questionable electioneering practices, such as, one, violating rules concerning the distribution of election flyers, two, extending offers of introduction to one or two select candidates to arrange speaking engagements at some village club meetings, subsequently denying invitations to other candidates. Three, one director has been observed spending many hours over the course of several days in the lobby of this building meeting with village residents and in at least one instance assisting a resident complete and submit an election ballot at the reception desk. I bring these matters to your attention for your further consideration and determination. Finally, I implore all village residents to exercise their right to vote in the board elections. As a former United Board member, I urge residents to vote for candidates with the experience, demeanor, and worth ethic required to fulfill the duties of a director. And I personally endorse United Board incumbents Dorothy Janey Durrell, Carl Randazzo, and former director Anthony Libatori as they have proven records of service to United residents in our entire village. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> next. OK, our next speaker is Maxime McIntosh. I know I speak for hundreds and hundreds of people when I thank Don and Pat for their service, not only this term, but past terms for years. And they've really educated themselves to everything here in the village as well as in United Mutual, and it made them really enriching members of the board. I'm so glad they're running for GRF. I hope the uh, corporate members in their wisdom will elect both of them so we finally get some people from United on the GRF board again. Uh, on my walks. Uh, especially between Clubhouse 1 and Clubhouse 3. I've stopped uh, all the strangers I thought were smiling and wouldn't mind me stopping them and ask them if they voted. And I want you to know I've been uh, propelling forward all the good things I know about all of you running. And of course, it's all positive, but mo mostly I would say, have you voted yet? And when they'd say no, I didn't ask if they threw it away, which some of them admitted they had or what. I just said, uh, you know, you can get another ballot. It's so easy. I misplaced mine one time. People throw them away and change their minds. All the community center, or I had that day, I had with me the, uh, uh, the number for them to call. I said, it's so easy to get another ballot. You know, please vote. I want to uh, direct your attention, uh, everyone in the room, not just the board, if you've not yet noticed, before we get to 13A, that um, all the clubhouses as used today have been excluded in this document from oversight by the corporate members, from decision making by the corporate members, all the clubhouses. And clubhouse three is the one that's mentioned specifically. Uh, the clubhouses are mentioned with tight limitations, which should not, of course, be there. But clubhouse three is mentioned as a PAC as an exclusion. So I'm very concerned that you might lose the right to vote on money being spent on renovations, reconstruction, and remodeling. Um, just, just, I just want us all to keep in mind how important you must hang on to your corporate vote. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. <clears throat> okay, our next speaker is Mary Stone. Mary Stone, 356C. First of all, I want to thank, uh, thank you for thinking my presentation was worthy of putting in the records. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is uh, I've been uh, walking a dog for the last uh, week or so. And unfortunately, the dogs don't walk on the sidewalk all the time. And I have noticed a very large portion of the Avenida Castilla landscape area recently uh, sprayed with herbicide because the grass on the edge is all dying. And for some reason or other, I thought we were not going to be spraying the herbicides in those areas. And I'm talking about quite a wide swath of, of the spraying so that 
that uh, it's enlarging the foundation planter areas. Uh, and I think, that, I think that we should not be doing this. I thought we weren't going to. Uh, I understand that third is no longer using any herbicides in that way, and I think it should be considered by this board. Thank you. Okay, and our last speaker is Cash Akrakar, speaking as a resident. Good morning. My name is Cash, 201E. Since January, I have been approaching different com committees as well as staff to get cul-de-sac 23 uh, entrance redlined because there's a big blind spot. And first, I was, the security came in and agreed with me to paint two red lines on both sides of the curbs, but nobody has done that. Only thing that has happened is the yellow marked, chalk marked those particular regions, but nothing else was done. Then I was told it is United's responsibility, so I brought this topic up again at the United Advisory Board and still nothing has been done. It's almost end of the year coming up. And I'm hoping that we redline these areas to prevent any accidents happening because there's a big blind spot on both sides. I'm talking about cul-de-sac 23. Also, I would like to request all the members of the association to vote because it's very important. We exercise our rights. And we have three good candidates already on the ballot there who have sufficient experience. Um, again, I don't know if I should mention names or not, but please vote, whoever you select. Four votes are needed. Thank you. Thank you, Cash. <coughs> that concludes our speakers. Okay. All right, uh, responses to uh, the speakers. Are there any uh, directors who would like to give responses to the speakers? I would particularly like to ask <coughs> Maggie to speak to um, Mr. Leonard's um, speak, talk this morning. She has the rules and regulations on campaigning. All right. <clears throat> uh, first, though, I will speak to the uh, negative remarks about United. This is chapter 60, or chapter 20, XX. Section 61 of Robert's Rules of Behavior. Its members refrain from conduct injurious to the organization or its purposes. An organization or assembly has the ultimate right to make or enforce its own rules and to require that its members refrain from conduct injurious to the organization or its purposes. Robert says no one should be allowed to remain a member if his retention will do this kind of harm. Then in the next paragraph it says, for example, tending to injure the good name of the organization, disturb its well-being, or hamper its work. This section goes on for about five pages. It is not to be fooled with. Secondly, this is the distribution of materials, Resolution 01-1503, passed January 13, 2015. Any materials distributed to United Mutual members shall bear identification as to its source. Distribution of materials, A. Door-to-door -door distribution of materials shall be permitted as long as the act of distributing distributing such material does not rise to the level of creating a nuisance for Laguna Woods Village residents. Material that is distributed door to door may only be secured on the surface of the thresholds of the front doors. It may not be hung from doorknobs or placed in mailboxes or left on vehicles in carports. Posting of material, laundry room bulletin boards are available only for residents. Only one posting per subject matter. The size must be half a page. 
Each posting by a resident or resident organization must identify the posting, the individual's name, and posting date. As to recreation, flyers in racks in clubhouses must be approved in advance. All flyers in the clubhouses, that's in the clubhouse, must be approved. This is the recreation rule. So for those of you that don't know where to look, you look for recreation on the thing, and then you see the rules. Flyers must be approved in advance by the recreation department. Flyer must be supplied by a club, group, or organization. Sponsor identification is required on the flyer. So if you are following all of these rules, then you are okay. If you are not following any one of these rules, then you are breaking a resolution and a recreation rule. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Pat, uh, again, it looks like our request to speak is on, but okay. I All will right. recognize you. Thank you. <clears throat> I would just like to say, as far as what Cash said about the redlining of the entrances to the cul-de-sacs, I totally agree with it, and I think we probably should have it on the MNC, the next MNC. And I think all cul-de-sacs you should do that with. I have noticed it many times that someone has parked there, and it's very dangerous because you can't see the main road you're coming to. And my second remark is, I th are we now, uh, when we're responding, we are still limited to three minutes, is that correct? That's correct. Well, um, I don't think Marcus lasted three minutes. <laughs> I think it was quite a bit longer. Thank you. All right, uh, it's up to three minutes. You don't have to use the whole three minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, are there any other responses from directors? Okay. <laughs> Seeing none. Sorry. Yes, <clears throat> Director Trone. Uh, yes, I've been on the uh, next door because there's a misunderstanding that uh, uh, many people say that responded with our current landscape. Could you uh, halt, I'm sorry, until he stops this, because I can't hear. Thank you, now. OK, let's start over. Uh, yes, I'm the one that uh, went on next door, because there are a lot of misconceptions that uh, the, uh, the reason for the bad service, landscape services, is because of a lack of uh, uh, understaffed. Uh, and my response was, understaffed has nothing to do with quality work. When you do something, you have to finish it, not just uh, uh, do part of it and then ignore the other part of a, a, a section of your work, or just uh, uh, pile up the uh, debris and then not clean it up. That's a quality chair, has nothing to do with understaffed. If the staff is overscheduled, overloaded, they couldn't finish everything on time, that's a management issue, but that's not an understaffed issue. So that's the issue that we need to pay attention to and we also need to resolve it. Please don't use understaffed as excuse, saying because understaffed, so we couldn't do everything right. That is something that very misunderstood uh, and somebody spreading this kind of rumor around to say, we are understaffed so we cannot do our job. That's not right. So that's what I wanna uh, emphasize on that. As far as campaigning, um, when uh, the president knew, knew that I was uh, uh, working with certain candidates and the president came to me and said, Andre, it would be nice if you can bring other uh, candidates over that uh, I recommend them should uh, go to your uh, uh, candidate meetings. So it was uh, acknowledged that it was the right procedure, it was accepted, uh, and I don't know why it's a complaint again. Thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> Janie. I'm running as a candidate. And I have had some of my friends be insulted by having a knock at their door with a flyer given to them with people that they don't recognize and they don't appreciate it. I also have a friend 
that was walking on the street, taking a walk, and been handed a flyer on whom to vote for and was very insulted. I believe in ethics, and I believe in doing this election in a very ethical way. And I am very disappointed to see that we have board members going out, giving, dis distributing, and talking to people on how to vote and who to vote for. And I witnessed one of our board members in front of the community center last week showing someone that just happened to have a ballot in her hand on he pointed to whom to vote for. I know it's freedom of speech, but where are our ethics here? All right. <clears throat> are there any other responses from the board on the issues that were brought up in the open forum? If not, we will go to... <clears throat> No, you've already responded. It's not my, I didn't do that. So don't look at me. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Andre, we're not looking at you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's go to number nine, our update from VMS, which is Director Libatori. Anthony, would you please give us your report? Morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, directors. And good morning to United Residents. One thing that... I was distracted because when I see myself on TV, I realize how old I am. It's disturbing, <laughs> very disturbing. I don't feel old, but I sure do look it. Anyway, our, man our present management provides the village with an optimistic future. Prior to the fall of 2015, the village was managed by the PCM, Pacific Community Management a wholly owned subsidiary of Associa, which is owned by a Texas politician. It's a privately held for-profit corporation, euphemistically known as PCM. PCM's mission, to enhance Associa's bottom line. And to accomplish this, staff's mission was to keep the governing boards in line with its vision of enhancing their bottom line. To this end, pay incentives rewarded the executive for not investing in the, in the community. Bonuses based on how much money was spent each year. And, and that's a gimmick that a lot of us learn in, in management. Put one number on there and then cut it down by 10,000, enhances your bonus. So infrastructure, because of this, the study infrastructure throughout the village was grossly neglected and amenities fell into disrepair. But a visionary and very committed group of residents, realizing that major changes needed to be made in how Laguna Woods Village was managed. So in October 2015, our agreement with PCM was terminated. A new not-for-profit management company, Village Management Services, was born. An extensive executive search resulted in securing Mr. Brad Hudson as our CEO. So with this change, our destiny was placed in our hands. Village Management Services works to serve the needs of the residents in both Third Mutual, United Mutual, and of course, in Golden Ring Foundation. BMS is overseen by a board of directors comprised of resident directors. Unlike one of the associate boards in Sun City, that PCM infiltrated the board with their own staff member. Brad, the BMS board, and the BMS board of directors launched into an acquisition and placement of competent, aggressive, and forward-looking management types for department heads, which gives us great expectations moving forward. Current department heads are now dealing with issues that have festered for years. For example, an issue that may not be uh, aware of all United people, the pool at Clubhouse 4. I'll let staff uh, tell you the gory details that were discovered when routine maintenance was attempted. Also, the building a clubhouse force and its amenities has some imposing issues that are being dealt with forthwith. 
transportation. VMS is determined to provide a transportation system to please all residents with efficient and on-demand service. The garden centers. The garden centers are no longer somebody's money-making project. They no longer look like a homeless encampment. Which, by the way, Orange County and its municipalities are at an impasse on how to sensitively deal with people who have fallen on hard times. The equestrian center. I can't speak in detail about that since I only pass by it on my way to my garden plot every other morning. I do know by observation that it is well maintained and a charming part of our community. This building, the community center, do I need to go into any detail about what your eyes can see as you walk in the front door? Clubhouse 5 now has an active gym, the result of VMS listening to residents. We have an absolutely outstanding gym facility here in this building. And also, I use the gym three or four times a week, and I use it here, and I use it in Clubhouse One. And I think there's Clubhouse One maybe a little jealousy. I hear some people bagging about the equipment there. But you know, a dumbbell is a dumbbell. <laughs> I can get all my, I can go on any treadmill, old or new, and get my cardio workout. Our staff at these facilities, first class. For me, all this is a result of coming, of coming together of the shareholders and the boards, working as a team and seizing control of our destiny. The non-bargaining and bargaining employees have a much more positive and engaging outlook in their efforts to be of service to residents. Now, in closing, looking to the future, moving ahead, I urge us to be on the lookout. I encourage and caution all of us, staff included, to be extremely attentive to our exposure to third party actions and lost time claims. From my past experience in corporate America, this can put you out of business. We should be searching for lawyers who have a good won and lost record in stifling these, uh, some of these superfluous claims. We have a lady on our staff now, and I won't mention names, that gives me great uh, optimism because she's focused on areas that I think what can help us reduce our risk factor, which is a component for insurance premiums. The accomplishments of the CEO, his team, have put outstanding effort in bringing the village far beyond what PCM could have done or would have done. Because of this, the boards, the residents, may have set maybe too high or unrealistic expectations for the immediate future. We can easily forget how many messes were left to us by PCM. Moving forward, let's be sure our expectations are realistic as we move forward as a community to continue to make this the special place that it is. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Directors and residents of United. Thank you, Director Libatori. All right, we go to item 11 on our agenda. Out of order, out of order. Out of order. Reports do not need questions. If you have a question for Director Libatori, you can do it afterwards. You were out of order. Out of order, not recognized by the chair. Okay, that's enough. <clears throat> All right, the consent calendar. No, CEO. Oh, I'm sorry. Just skip over since you're. <laughs> it's Siobhan, not Brad, who's going to do the CEO report this morning. So I'm sorry. I... Thank you. Good morning, honorable. 
President, members of the board, it's my privilege to provide the CEO's update this morning. Senate Bill 1128, if you'll remember, sponsored by Senator Roth on behalf of the village, is on the governor's desk for consideration. This bill would bring significant benefit to the residents of Laguna Woods Village in the areas of uncontested elections, delivery of annual documents in writing or via email notification, and changes the notice requirements for pro proposed rule changes from 28 to 28 days rather than the current 30 days. Yeah. As we've been talking this morning, United Elections are underway. Ballot packages were delivered at the end of August. The ballots are due back by Wednesday, September 26th. United ballots will be counted by the Inspector of Elections on Friday, September 28th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. I wanted to update you this morning on our new service kiosks in, re in resident services. Not only are the new kiosks shortening the wait time for visitors to resident services and enhancing the efficiency and effectiveness of our customer service. The kiosks also provide important data that we have not been privy to before. For example, in August, the service kiosks tracked more than 6,500 visits to the resident services area. 23% of these visits were for vehicles and passes, 19% to manor alterations, 18% were ma maintenance related, and 16% were for leasing. The system also tracks the number of people each customer service represent representative takes care of. For example, in August, Abraham Ballesteros served 1,253 visitors, which is an average of 54 customers per day. Abraham works in the Manor Alterations Division. Southern California Edison has informed us that they are going to resume their uh, upgrade work that they had started earlier this summer. They expect to be back in the village on September 17th or sometime shortly thereafter. Again, uh, these dates are tentative, as you all are aware. Um, Edison doesn't always give us the precise date. Any residents affected by any planned outages will receive direct notice from Edison. I'm pleased to report that the gatehouse renovations are complete at gatehouses 4, 10, 11, and 12. These projects include interior and exterior renovations, including flooring, plumbing fixtures, doors, windows, painting, and HVAC. Preparations are underway for the installation of the RFID security gates at nine gates in the community. As you've been in the community center, you may have noticed some of the renovation work going, down, uh, going on down the hall, and this is to create um, the new space for manor alterations on the first floor of the community center. This will provide access to, re to residents and uh, contractors. They'll have the ability to meet with manor alteration staff, lay out plans, and receive a better quality of service. And that project will be uh, concluding shortly. I also wanted to mention that RV Lot A has been closed for asphalt and concrete repairs. and. Um, one of the areas where RVs may temporarily park is adjacent to Clubhouse 3 in United. So if you do see some RVs parked in the community, this is temporary until the new lot has been uh, received asphalt and concrete repairs. That project is expected to be completed by the end of October. And then just an announcement, please. Monday Night Football kicked off last evening, as many people are aware, and residents are encouraged to participate every Monday night at Clubhouse 5 in the main lounge. They can watch the games on the big screen. No ticket is required. Seating is on a first-come, first-served basis. They may uh, enjoy free chips and salsa. There are hot dogs for purchase and a no-host GRF bar. Next Monday's game features the Seattle Seahawks and the Chicago Bears, and kickoff is at 5.15 p.m. And that concludes my report this morning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we will move on to uh, <clears throat> number 11, which is the consent calendar. <clears throat> and we have two items from uh, Architectural Control and Standards Committee, and they are detailed in your agenda package. 
and we have <clears throat> five items from the Finance Committee, all liens against members who are in arrears on their assessments. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you, Pat. All right, it's been moved and seconded that the consent calendar be approved. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? I gather we don't have our voting buttons. Oh, there we do. Yeah, we do have voting <laughs> buttons. <laughs> Thank you. I have, I have the wrong button. <laughs> Can I hit it again? Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> okay, um, Director Armendariz, can I have your vote by verbal? Yay or nay? Can I just have your verbal vote and I'll put it in for you? Yes. All right, the consent calendar passes. We go to unfinished business, and this is item 12, and this is a motion, I will entertain a motion to approve the 2019 United Business Plan and Reserves Funding Plan, uh, which is uh, detailed in your packet, and I'd ask our secretary to read the resolution. Okay. Resolve September 11th, 2018, that the business plan of this corporation for the year 2019 is hereby adopted and approved. And resolve further that pursuant to said business plan, the board of directors of this corporation hereby estimates that the net sum of $39,117,592 is required by the corporation to meet the Laguna Woods mutual operating expenses and reserve contributions for the year 2019. In addition, the sum of $15,389,556 is required by the corporation to meet the Golden Rain Foundation and the Golden Rain Foundation Trust operating expenses and reserve contributions for the year 2019. Therefore, a total of $54,507,148 is required to be collected from and paid by the members of the corporation as monthly assessments. And resolve further that the board of directors of this corporation hereby approves expenditures from reserves in the sum of 14750524 of which 13378267 is planned from the reserve fund and 1372257 from the contingency fund and resolve further that the board of directors of this corporation hereby determines and establishes monthly assessments of the corporation as shown on each member's breakdown of monthly assessments for the year 2019. Inclusive of property taxes and property insurance as filed in the records of the corporation and set assessments to be due and payable by the members of this corporation on the first day of each month and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Do I have a second? <coughs> Pat, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there any discussion on this resolution? <coughs> Carl? Uh, <coughs> Out of order, not recognized by the chair. Carl, you are recognized. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this resolution is applicable to uh, what the increase in the assessment will be. Excuse me. Sorry about that. <coughs> this, uh, this resolution obviously has a increase in the assessment associated with it, is that correct? 
So as a result of that, we don't mention it in the resolution because we don't talk about it, okay, but maybe for the purposes of this particular uh, assembly and, and the people at home, we should just mention how much that means as far as when we approve this, if we approve this or what have you, what that would mean bottom line to them as an uh, increase in the assessment. That's what I'm saying. First and foremost, I encourage everyone to take a look at the breeze this month. There's a breakdown uh, in there, whether you do it online or you get a, a physical copy, which with three different graphs that helps to explain this. Uh, <clears throat> the increase is $9, excuse me, Gary, $9.53. And that includes $4.24 for GRF. It includes $5 that goes to our reserves. We were very good on operations this year. First and foremost, we took a number of things out of the operation budget and put it in our reserves because they were multi-year. Secondly, we came in under budget, 76 cents. Uh, on our operations. So everybody always says, but mine is so much more than that. That has to do with, as she read, the property taxes and property insurance. Each unit is individual, depending on what they've been upgraded, when was the last time they were assessed, are they, is it a newly uh, uh, sold uh, share, that kind of thing. It all influences how much property tax you have, and we can't have a standard for that. However, our finance department does get a bill, and they do proportion it out uh, according to the unit. So whatever you have, $9.53 is the uh, increase that we are doing for United and GRF for all your amenities. Anything above that is your property taxes. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Andre, you had a question, comment? Uh, from the very beginning, we've been trying, uh, and I want to make sure that you understand that I'm taking, these are your money. I'm taking your money as my own money, and I want to make sure that these money are well spent. Uh, so once the budget started, uh, I was asking the question, how do you come up with these numbers? And the, the response was, this is the initial one. We will provide you uh, later on. So afterwards, the second one I was asking, where are the uh, justifications for these numbers? How do you come up with these numbers? And the answer was, uh, we have a formula. We follow the formula. And I said, OK, give, me, give us the formula. How do you come up with the formula? And the answer was, oh, we made some changes to it. I said, okay, give me some, the reason, uh, the formula and the reason for the changes. And we were never given all these changes. And, uh, and a lot of times, sometimes the response was, oh, we provide information to the finance, and the finance comes up with the numbers. So at this point, I haven't received any justifications why these numbers. Uh, if it's my own money, I won't, I won't approve this, I won't, uh, and the vendor tells me I need this, no, I, I don't know how many people I'm gonna spend you, I don't know how, what's the time schedule, uh, I can tell you whatever, uh, you know, how much this one. I will most likely find another vendor to do this job, which, who can give me some more details, uh, and, and give me some confidence that yes, that he, can, he knows how to do this job, all the monies are well spent, so I have some questions about these resolutions, and I haven't received any responses yet. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Director Armendariz. Thank you, Juanito. Um, I just have uh, three comments uh, regarding the 2019 business plan. Uh, and this is uh, so that the members uh, are aware of some of these facts. Um, the only reason I'm not in favor of this business plan is because uh, in analyzing the actual expenditures for reserves for the last two and a half years, I discovered that the amounts actually spent were $5.8 million less than the actual budget. So I had proposed that we not increase the assessment for this year by uh, reducing the uh, assessment amount for reserves by $5. 
That meant that we could have had the same assessment amount for this year, next year that we had for this year. Uh, the second item is that in this business plan uh, of about $50 million, a third of that is for salaries and wages, for which all we see is numbers of employees. We actually see no dollar amounts as far as any breakdown of compensation. So it is difficult to me, for me to understand how you could approve a budget of that amount with that much represented by salaries and wages and see nothing on it and approve it. And the last item I have, uh, I've been told that they've, by some people that uh, they understood I was against reserves. I'm not against reserves. I know they're a vital part of financing for our future needs. But uh, the last item I have is that for this meeting, we just received this breakdown of the uh, component uh, reserve requirements to be fully funded. And unfortunately, what I found was that <clears throat> there appear to be some major discrepancies in the calculation of these amounts. And it appears to me that the amount calculated here is understated by several million dollars. I'm in the process of checking all those numbers, and I will be submitting my report to Betty Parker as well as the directors later this week when I complete my analysis. If it's true that this is understated by several million dollars, then I'm sure last year was too, and I will continue reviewing last year's, and I'll submit both of my findings to Betty Parker and to the rest of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Director Armandiris. <clears throat> Are there any other comments? Yes. <clears throat> Gary? I would like to reply to Director Armandiris, um, and as we have discussed this before, we budget for specific items and we would like to accomplish those items such as waistline remediation. However, you might budget a certain amount of money and because of a time element or because they run into problems, they can't finish what they had anticipated finishing. Does not mean that that money just is thrown back into the pot and that the problem goes away. The problem does not go away and it has to be addressed the following year. So it's not something that you can just give the money back to people because there's a problem. I would like to mention that this is only the business plan that we are voting on. There is a separate resolution on reserves. So. <clears throat> With no more comments, I would call for the vote on the business plan as <clears throat> a motion made by Maggie and seconded by Pat. Would you please vote? <clears throat> Reza? Why does it work? <clears throat> no. We're still missing one vote. That's only 10. <coughs> uh, Director Durrell. Can I do it this time? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, the uh, business plan passes eight to three. <coughs> and now we'll look at the resolution on the reserve fund for 2019. If you would read that resolution, please, Madam Secretary. Whereas Civil Code 5570 requires specific reserve funding disclosure statements for common interest <coughs> developments, and whereas planned assessment or other contributions to reserves must be projected to ensure balances will be sufficient at the end of each year to meet the corporation's obligations for repair and or replacement of major components during the next 30 years, now, therefore, be it resolved September 11, 2018, that the board has developed and hereby adopts the reserve 30-year funding plan attached. 
with the objective of maintaining reserve fund balances at or above a threshold of $10,400,000 while meeting its obligations to repair and or replace major components and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out uh, the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Don will let you do that this time. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded uh, that we <clears throat> accept the 2019 Reserve Fund Resolution. Discussion? Andre? Uh, as far as the reserve plan is concerned, uh, uh, Director Amadeus has uh, uh, mentioned that we have a surplus for the last year. I'm not sure if it was 20% or 14%, something like that. Okay. Uh, so uh, last year we have a 20% surplus because we have the jobs that are not done and we need to move it to this year. And Director Morrison has mentioned, yes, they will be done this year, so we need a budget. And let's look at the numbers. Last year, we finished 80% of what we set out to do. This year, we not only have to finish 100% of what we need to do, we need also need to finish 20% more that we didn't do last year, and a few more percent we didn't do a year before, 2017. So let's assume that we finish 120% we need to finish 120% of what we set out to do, which is 40% more than what we accomplished the last year, 80%, which means we have 40% extra out of the what 80% uh, uh, capacity that we have. That's 50% more. So in a sense that we need to finish 50% more than what we set out to do. So whether we, do we have to uh, I haven't heard any kind of explanation as far as how do we meet this 50% more demand that needs to be done. Every year seems like we have extra left to do. Yes, we are under budget, but yes, we will finish next year. And every year we have things that are not uh, completed. So I do have a question. How, man, from the management point of view, how do we meet that kind of demand of work? Do we need more people? Do we need uh, uh, more budget? Need more new equipment? Do we need to change management style in order to make it more efficient and effective? I haven't heard about that. It's just uh, give us more budget and we'll make it happen. I think that's a little bit irresponsible. Just give promises and don't give a plan. Thank you very much. Director Randazzo. I was present during the meetings where VMS provided their explanation of the budget and the reserve requirements this year. And while it is true that we have excess amounts this year and we weren't able to spend the money, we also have to go back to uh, Anthony Liberatore's remarks about the fact that it's only been two years since PCM has been out of here. And they left a mess. VMS, in the short time that they've been here, have done a very good job. Is it perfect? Never. Nothing's ever perfect. I listened to all of the remarks that were made by their budget people, and I was felt that the inf information that was provided the explanation that was provided was acceptable for me to vote for the $9.53. Let's put that in perspective now. $9.53, let's make it $10. That's $120 a year. This money will be put, part of this money will be put into the reserves. And these reserves right now do not just go into a blind trust or what have you. They are interest-bearing money. So we either take the $120 and have you put it in your bank, and then we ask you for $50 some other year when we find out we have a problem where there was a flood or something, okay, we have no contingency and we have to give you, ask for an additional $50 or $100, or we each year ask for $120 for the whole year to make sure that our reserves are sustainable, it will be gaining interest. We get that $120, you put it in your bank, you're only going to get 0.01%, we get a lot better than that. So under the circumstances right now, 
having been a project manager for $100 million jobs, I reviewed and I looked at the budget information that was provided to us by VMS. I found it to be acceptable. I voted for it to be yes. I feel that the money should be put into our reserves, and that's my feelings on the matter. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any other comments? I, I would like to make one. <clears throat> As I mentioned Hello. before, we moved. May I finish mine first? No, I wanted to comment on this. All right, I will call on you. But may I finish my comment? Okay. Thank you. Major projects were moved from operations into reserves so that we would have the money over the next few years. Many of our projects are six years, seven years, and not our, our budgets are annual budgets. And if they're not in reserves, we can't take the money from operations, put it in reserves when we don't use it all, bring it back when we do need it to finish those projects. Um, also, everybody should understand, as Director Rendosa said, we've been working on this for months. We have had many meetings with staff and budgets where they have explained all of this. And I regret that it's not to Director Trong's satisfaction and did not get the questions that he wanted answered. But for most of us, this is substantiated. Director Basari. If I understand correctly, uh, Director Hall's uh, comment is that this is some type of insurance for us, uh, getting this additional money and uh, getting it to pay us interest. But that defeats the whole purpose of insurance. We don't want to insure ourselves by this. That's why we go to insurance companies, because this can spread the risk and give a better return than what we can to the banks and other places that they give us interest. So I'm against it. All right, um, any other comments? <clears throat> Director Drill. I understand that it's about approximately 15% for our reserves. I also have heard where there are other homeowners associations, reserves are about 60%. I believe that what we're doing and listening to staff and the reports and all, that I am in favor of this this. Uh, approval of the budget. And I uh, don't understand why people don't realize that if we had a disaster here, like let's say that we don't have enough money in our reserves for roofing, our roofing. I've heard of small associations that have been assessed with $14,000 assessments. So I believe what we have here is right in order of our 15% for our reserves. I also want to make a comment that there have been problems with when we do our billing, we have vendors that don't come back real quickly and pay us. And so when you look at our budgets, it looks like some of these projects aren't getting done or whatever. Uh, I also realize that the city has held us up on our uh, hot water heater program. So there's reasons why when you look at our budget, that we haven't completely spent our money, although the work has been done or we have been held up by uh, the city. <clears throat> Director English. Uh, yes, I would like to say that I agreed with what um, Director Randozzo said, and I support this um, reserve fund resolution and the method we are using, the threshold method, and uh, I think we're right on target. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Arkar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have had several re uh, revisions of this thing. We literally hashed it to death three, three times. And I, I think we are just wasting time of the staff and everybody else trying to do it over and over and over again and boiling it. It's not going to change the flavor. All we are doing is putting the money in the, our reserve account. We're not charging and spending that money for any useless purposes, it's going to be safe money earning interest. It's your money, all the 
members. It belongs to every one of you, but it's in one bank instead of having in 6,300 different banks. That's it. Let's move on. Thank you. I'm for this resolution. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, were there any requests to speak? Yes, we have Mary Stone that requested to speak on this item. C. If you would look on page 21 and 22 of agenda item 12A, there is a reserve component schedule. This schedule shows you the various components, the quantities, the unit costs, the estimated life, the remaining life, the total cost, and what is fully funded balance is how much you have put into a reserve account for those various components. And then when you look at the bottom line on page 22, you see that uh, your projected reserve balance, you know, uh, you have your reserve balances there. If you fully funded that balance, you would have $109,702,700, $109,702,251. You are currently 15% funded. Your deficiency is 92 million, you know, a little more than 92 million. Your deficiency per unit is $14,687. If you were going to have a specific reserve percentage as most smaller uh, associations have, you would probably have, you know, uh, a, a great, a lesser deficiency per unit. But right now, if you were fully funded, your, your, your uh, reserves were fully funded, you would need an additional $14,687. Per unit. Per minute. Per, u per, per <coughs> unit. Yes, per unit. So, you know, when you think about it, a lot, of, a lot of other associations would say, hey, we want to be fully funded. They're going to give them a special assessment in that amount. You guys are working with a threshold balance that says we keep a minimum threshold balance. In, this, in our case, it's a little over $10 million. And so that is our buffer. We don't want to put $109 million in a bank account or in an investment of some sort or another. That would be very risky. So this is the way we do this. And I think it's, it's, for, it's important for directors to understand that you have to manage the risk. Now we talk about, we talk about this like an, it's an insurance account. It's not an insurance account. We have additional insurance, property insurance and various other insurances. This is a reserve account. That's what it's for, and that's what you're voting on, and that's this part of your business plan. Reserve components. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? <clears throat> no, that concludes our speakers. <coughs> Andre? <coughs> Why the second time? Okay, I, I, I don't believe I've ever said don't in, invest the money. I believe what I'm saying is the productivity side. We've, uh, our productivity, we spend 80%, we spend 100% labor money, all the people employed, 100% of the employee budget, finished 80% of the work that we've accomplished. And next year, we want to uh, spend 100% and finish 120% of the activities we budgeted this year plus last year. I doubt it. We're going to make it. Director and Chong, you are a, repeating yourself. You said yes. this before. Yes, let me repeat myself. No, we again. don't want you to repeat yourself. One the productivity comment, is unless what you have concerned. something new to say. Yeah. The productivity out is out of my order. Thank you. All right, I'll call for the vote.
All right, the vote is eight to three. The uh, <coughs> reserve fund resolution passes. All right, the next item on our agenda is new business. And our first item, <coughs> a motion to approve a resolution inter interpreting GRF bylaws 214. I'll let the secretary read the resolution and then I'm going to ask our attorney. Uh, Jeff Beaumont to give a little background on this because he has worked with the other attorneys on this. It's, what about 13B? We're not doing 13? Well, we're going to do 13A first. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let me find it. <clears throat> ah, okay. Oh, yes. I'll start. All right, uh, we'll ask Jeff to give his report first then. Good. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to just introduce um, the board um, as to this proposed resolution of the corporate members, as well as the members that are in attendance and that are viewing this meeting on television. Uh, this goes back to uh, many years ago where there was a swing of the pendulum with respect to GRF's authority to spend uh, money and to spend money on trust property and improvements. Uh, back then, there was a recreation master plan proposed that included something around nine to ten million dollars um, of the use of reserve funds, plus an additional nine or ten million dollars in a loan, um, which was not um, approved by the corporate members. Uh, in response, the uh, mutuals, um, particularly with United taking a very, very assertive position, challenge that and um, fast forward, we now have an amendment to the GRF bylaws and to the trust agreement that was passed um, by each mutual and the corporate members to limit and control the authority of GRF to spend money on trust property. And that amendment was to uh, again, the trust agreement and the GRF bylaws, particularly bylaw section 2.1.4. Now, after that amendment has been in place and a few years have gone by, it's been in practice, we've seen some challenges with it, uh, which um, after the mutuals have gotten together and discussed this with their legal counsel, we determined that there needs to be clarification as to how um, GRF is to um, come back to the corporate members for approval <coughs> for certain expenditures. With that, uh, section 2.1.4 of the GRF bylaws gives GRF the authority to construct new facilities or add or expand to existing facilities up to 1,000 square feet and a cost of um, up to $500,000. If any of those improvements exceed 1,000 square feet of new space or exceed $500,000, then GRF has to come back to the corporate members. And as you know, the corporate members are the members of each mutual's board for special approval. Bear with me, I wanna give you now a summary of what's being proposed. And this resolution um, should take a two-step approach. The United Board today should approve this resolution. Um, if it's approved by the board, it will then go before the corporate members for a corporate member vote. And a resolution that's approved by the corporate members can be changed by the corporate members. So this is the first time the corporate members have visited a resolution clarifying section 2.1.4. I can tell you right now, it's not gonna be the last time this will be addressed because we'll see areas in the future that will want to massage and modify and make sure they're meeting our current needs. Your needs are going to change over the years and so should this resolution, which is why this resolution is so valuable because you are in the driver's seat. The corporate members can make adjustments throughout the years much easier than you could make a change to the GRF bylaws or to the trust agreement. 
So what this resolution does is it interprets 2.1.4. And again, let me repeat, 2.1.4 says, GRF has to first go to the corporate members for approval before making certain improvements or additions to trust property in excess of 1,000 square feet or before spending in excess of $500,000. The GRF trust agreement um, has certain definitions, one of which is it defines facilities, which is rather vague. What does facility mean, for example? Um, this is just one of several ambiguities with the trust agreement and the GRF bylaws that this 2.14 um, doesn't clarify as to when does GRF come to us for approval when spending money on a certain component in the community, in the village. Um, in all, the resolution is needed and intended to reduce the uncertainty associated with GRF business or activities that do or do not require approval of the corporate members. In the past, this uncertainty has created conflict, inefficiency, and delay, among other things. So let me take you by a step-by-step -step approach. First, there's a special meeting of the corporate members. The resolution sets forth that each July, a meeting will be held so that GRF can present any business or projects that require approval to the corporate members. At the meeting, the members may then vote or prior to the meeting, they could vote by ballot um, to approve or disapprove proposed projects by GRF. And July is key because that's right before the GRF budget is approved. And if a project is approved in July, that would be included by GRF in its budget for the following year. Now let's talk, take the next step, step two, as to this resolution and talk about project costs. I told you that Section 2.1.4 of GRF bylaws mentions a $500,000 threshold. Well, not too long ago, there was a project proposed that was below $500,000 in the actual construction costs, but if you put soft costs into that, soft cost meeting plans, designs, permits, it brought that number well above $500,000. So does $500,000 include hard costs, construction, swinging hammers, um, or does it include also soft costs, designs, and professional fees? That's what this resolution seeks to clarify. So in establishing GRF's construction limitation of $500,000 or more, it is essential to determine exactly what costs make up and add up to this number. Therefore, the resolution defines the makeup of a total project cost. In the resolution, you'll see that the total project cost includes, among other things, the aggregate expense associated with the construction of a building or recreational facility, including pre-construction costs, preliminary designs, concepts, appraisals, et cetera. Any costs incurred in development of preliminary designs and cost estimates incurred before they have been presented to the corporate members. Costs associated with engineering to generate a final plan, estimating the project cost, design, consultants, engineers, architects. The estimated costs of new equipment and refurbishments associated with such construction. It also includes a 10% contingency above the actual estimated costs. And as you know, any project should have a contingency fee for overruns, et cetera. So let's talk about the types of construction specifically requiring approval of the corporate members. So there's a provision in this resolution, the third now therefore be it resolved, is really where the meat and potatoes of this resolution lies. It establishes exactly what type of GRF construction and other activities require approval of the corporate members. For example, approval is required for clubhouse, gym facility, or new office building structures involving a total project cost of over $500,000. These are new facilities. The resolution further clar clarifies that recreational facility structures requiring approval by way of providing examples, like a new pickleball court, for example, or a new bocce ball court, a new tennis court, a new lawn bowling area. These would all be improvements requiring corporate member approval. In addition to new GRF structures, the construction of additions to existing buildings are also addressed in the $500,000 or more project total. 
or if the construction involves the addition of more than a thousand square feet of an existing structure. Those types of improvements would require corporate member approval. And the resolution provides examples of what changes do not constitute um, approval of the corporate members. So I think just as important as listing what does require approval is equally important than listing what does not require approval. For example, we're sitting in a very, very nicely renovated boardroom, and that would be an example of something that would not require corporate member approval. Renovating an existing boardroom, relocation of your nice gym in this building um, from the second floor back down to the first floor. Those are things that GRF can do without corporate member approval in this resolution. The uh, resolution also talks about the definition of demolition and rebuilding. Um, so in conclusion, the goal of the resolution is to provide clarity to the GRF bylaws, specifically section 2.1.4 in conjunction with the trust agreement, so that GRF's business and projects as they pertain to the mutuals are expressly defined and approval for these activities are clearly outlined. So the expectations of the corporate members and the GRF board are aligned and not in conflict and they don't conflict. So with that, um, if the board has any questions about the resolution, um, I'm here to help. First of all, I see a number of you looking at the pink resolution. Please note that you have an updated resolution and staff report that was at your area when you sat down. And that's what we're going to be voting on. <clears throat> Director Armendaris. I, oh, I'm sorry. We need read? to read it and get a motion, and then I'll ask for All right. comments. On your uh, blonde pink copy, <laughs> white. Uh, it's, it's a white copy, but ordinarily it would be pink. It was part of the package that you received this morning. I'm reading from page item 13A, page 3 of 7. I will read the first paragraph there. Whereas GRF is required to obtain approval of the corporate members prior to engaging in any business or activity specified in paragraph 2.1.4 of its bylaws, bylaw 2.1.5, not included in a previously approved budget. And I'm reading the last one, that's page 13A, 7 of 7, the last paragraph, as Jeff has explained the intervening ones. Now, therefore, be it further resolved that the term demolition, as used in subparagraph 5 of paragraph M of section 7 of the trust agreement, shall mean to completely remove a facility, as that term is defined in subparagraph 4 of paragraph M of section 7 of the trust agreement, and not replace it that the term rebuilding refers to reconstruction of an existing facility after its complete demolition. And neither the term demolition nor rebuilding shall refer to the renovation of an existing facility that does not involve a complete demolition. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move this resolution. I second it. <clears throat> and I'd like to make the point that what we are voting on today is our approval, endorsement of this resolution to go forward to the corporate members. Our approval or disapproval of this today does not uh, finalize it. This is a GRF bylaw that we are talking about. The corporate members have input on that, and it will be voted on at the corporate members meeting. <clears throat> Director English. Are we going to vote on it now, too? Yes, we are. Good. I'd like to say something when it's All right. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> do I have a second? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. She okay. did. You did. Okay. Uh, now we'll have discussion. Pat? Okay. Um, in my opinion, <clears throat> this resolution and the one that preceded it 
which, which was the GRF bylaw modification to 2.1.4 and 2.1.6, is probably the most important resolution that you will vote on. And I believe that this clarification is really something we need too. And we probably will find more clarifications in the future, I would expect. The only thing I would be concerned of, and that is that we do not trigger something where we all have to end up in court again. And I would ask Jeff, Jeff, can you assure me that this isn't something that we'll end up in court again? <laughs> Let me get my crystal ball out. <laughs> I, I can tell you this in response to that very good question. This significantly significantly reduces uh, the opportunity and potential of conflict which would result in litigation. Okay. Are there any more, any more discussion? Dr. Rector Almadiris? Um, thank you, Juanita. Uh, can we make some suggestions for some changes in this document right now? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I've got uh, three items. Uh, on page five of seven, item two, uh, the construction of a new recreational facility intended for use by GRF members. And I wanted to add after that, or members guests. And then it goes on to say, or GRF employees. I didn't think GRF had any employees. I thought all employees were VMS employees. Correct? Mm -hmm. So that language shouldn't apply. And then what agents or invitees do we allow to use these facilities? Why do we have that in there? Okay, another point. Okay, the next point is uh, item three. Uh, one, two, three, the fifth sentence down where it says, or recreational facility by more than 1,000 square feet. I think the original language was Recreational facility by 1,000 feet or more. So that makes a difference with 1,000 or 1,001. Okay. Did you have a third point? Okay, and then a four, item four. Uh, after E, there's a section that talks about items that would not be considered a modification. And I believe, in my opinion, that A, that A, B, and C should go up under E as F, G, and H. Because I think the renovation of the board meeting room, I think we'd want approval for that. I would think the relocation of the gym from the second floor to the first floor, we'd want approval rights for that. And I think the renovation of Clubhouse 3 in a manner where it retains its use, you know, why wouldn't we want approval rights for that? if it's gonna involve several million dollars. So those are my three recommended changes. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? <clears throat> Director okay. Randosa. Yeah, I have a question regarding the uh, total project cost. Uh, having been in the industry doing project work for many years, the uh, demolition of a particular building or whatever it is, okay, that needs to be demoed, okay, plus the engineering associated with that and the drawings or what have you that may go along with it, okay, depending on how big it is, okay, is a substantial cost, okay, and under the total project cost, while the soft cost, which means the design, engineering, and the construction, okay, and obviously the, the uh, actual uh, implementation of the whole thing, okay, we don't address the demolition costs, which could be substantial. To, I mean, on a $500,000 job, it could be substantial. Uh, and as a result of that, I, my question is, why don't we address demolition as being part of total project cost? Because it's not, in some, it's not something that's small. Thank you. Are there any other comments? <clears throat> yes, Director Trong. Um, page, third, uh, agenda item 13A, page four of seven. The second paragraph, it talked about a lot of costs, but I don't see they mentioned the VMS staff labor costs. 
Uh, I know sometimes uh, some projects are done initially in, uh, internally by BMS staff, staff doing some research and they need to do coordinations, they need to do quality check. A lot of these costs are not included in there. Uh, so I wonder if that should be uh, any BMS labor costs related uh, should be accounted for for this project. That's number one. Number two, um, on page five of seven, the bottom, starting from the bottom of the page, the following changes would not be considered as modification or, or replacement. A lot of words. The, the word that I'm particularly paying attention to is the renovation. What constitutes a renovation? renovation? Is it just a regular maintenance that we need to do as uh, already approved in the reserve? Or is it in addition, uh, for example, number C, item number C, uh, renovation of Clubhouse 3 in a manner where it retains its use as a performing arts center. Uh, is the new proposed $15 million renovation counted as a renovation or is just in addition to regular maintenance? So uh, if we let leave it as a re uh, renovation, uh, well, GRF, you uh, say this is a renovation, so it's already excluded in club, uh, and uh, of clubhouse already in excluded in there. Um, that would be a total uh, uh, misunderstanding of the word renovation. So I want to clarify what exactly renovation is. Is that just uh, uh, reserve regular maintenance? Well, if it's regular maintenance, we've already approved that. We have no problem. But if it's not regular maintenance and it's over uh, $500,000 overall, including the staff labor cost, we need to take a look at it uh, as a court member. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> In response, number one, I think you are spreading, if you will, an incorrect rumor. There is no $15 million project for the Performing Arts Center. Uh, that was an original cost that the designers did and it was sent back and said, this is not acceptable. So that is not on the table uh, right now. Secondly, I bring <clears throat> to your attention on page five of seven, number four in the middle, it defines modification mm -hmm. or repurposing refers to the modification or renovation of an existing facility. So it is, defined in there. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Leonard. Thank you. Um, to Director Tarn's remarks, um, VMS staff is a budget, budgeted annual overhead. And um, breaking out staff's time for each one of the renovations or projects that may be accomplished under GRF um, is irrelevant to the outside cost that is budgeted for those renovations. Um, renovations are replacements. This building needs three new air conditioning units on the roof. That is a renovation. Maintenance is when the cleaning crew comes in here every night and cleans the bathrooms. Um, correct that the Performing Arts Center uh, budget is not $15 million. I believe it's, we've appropriated $2 million for 2019 to renovate the stage and the scaffolding and the lighting and the things that Orange County Fire Authority has told us must be repaired mm -hmm. or they will shut the facility down. Um, that should be very apparent. And there was one other thing that uh, Director Armandera said, which I have now uh, <laughs> forgotten what I was going to address because of Mr. Torrance's remark. If I can recall it, I'll come back up. All right, Director Agricar. Uh, I understand what Director Armandera is, <coughs> is saying. But I think the confusion is on page five, the last sentence that says the following changes would not be considered. It, we, it should start with the sentence, for example, the following changes, because all these changes were under half a million dollars. 
So the, those paragraphs should start out just like uh, the one at the top that says, for example, the changes would be modification or repurposing. The following, the bottom, second sentence from bottom should also start with, for example, and it clarifies what he's talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> we have some requests to speak. Yes. Dick Rader, 270D. Um, I need a clarification. It says here that the bylaw limits the discretion of the GRF Corporation as to either the construction of a new facility, and this is the thing I'm going to question, or an addition or expansion of or to an existing facility of at least 1,000 new or additional square feet. This sounds like, if I'm understanding correctly, that it's a, it, the, the existing structure, let's say Clubhouse 2, that this means that additional square footage will be added to Clubhouse 2. Am I interpreting that correctly? Because what I'm concerned about is, let's say Clubhouse 2, GRF decides, mm -hmm. you know, we want to make a five, uh, at least a $500,000 investment in changing Clubhouse 2 internally without increasing the square footage. And that 500,000, I don't know, stages and elaborate lighting, whatever it is. According to my interpretation, you would not be able to um, bring the, uh, say that they were um, not obeying the bylaw. You wouldn't have any say. The mutuals would not be able to say anything. Yes, residents would be able to complain and say, do we really need it? Is it a need or a want? So do you understand the distinction that I'm trying to understand? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. We have a question on your face. Have I made it clear? <laughs> uh, <coughs> Is it new? I think it's I, clear. I, what if it, this resolution sounds like in order to uh, the GRF to be questioned about their expenditure, it's saying that you have to add an additional 1,000 square feet. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is correct? It's, it's an, Would you an additional 1,000 square feet or the expenditure of $500,000 or more. Right. So if, you, if they made a modification that uh, within Clubhouse 2 that was more than 1,000 square feet, you would then have the right to uh, bring it to the mutuals to vote. Uh, Correct. To discuss. Thank you very much. You got it. I think that uh, <clears throat> Mr. Rader has a good point. In the third whereas of the resolution, I would suggest that... Um, the last sentence, new or additional square feet or a cost of $500,000. It doesn't have to be an and, it's or. Am I correct? Yeah, it's or. No, it's Where are you? Page three of seven, the third whereas. Right. Well, on three of seven, it needs to be or. <laughs> Mr. Leonard. Um, I now recall um, yeah. the remark by Director Armanderas. He was questioning what civil invitees would be. Um, for example, uh, we have the uh, university where outside people come and attend classes. They are not residents and they are not guests. So I believe that is the intent of saying civil invitees into the facilities. Thank, Thank you, you for your clarification. Are there any other? <coughs> Dr. Rand, uh, Director Randos. Thank, Thank you for calling me doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I have a new title now. <laughs> uh, just my own edification here, when we vote on this, a lot of people made some comments regarding this particular uh, resolution. Are we voting on the comments also, meaning that the inclusion of the comments, or are we just going to vote as it is neat, the way it was originally? So uh, that's my concern. Question. I, I, that's a good question. And, and I would recommend to keep progress going forward, because the goal is to vote on this at the GRF annual meeting amongst the corporate members to 
vote on a resolution today that approves this resolution in principle subject to me taking all your comments all and just know that I'm taking very copious notes all of these comments I think are good ones back to the attorneys and then I will work with them to incorporate as many of these as I can most of which I think will go through because they're non-substantive they're more clarifying mm -hmm. and then this will go before you at the annual meeting of the corporate members but before then, I will send you all a report as to what I was able to inco incorporate into the resolution. So when you ultimately put your corporate member hat on to cast your ballot, you'll know which of these comments have been incorporated, which haven't. A red line. So I, I, today I would vote on this resolution um, with that understanding. Okay. <clears throat> Director English. Uh, yes, I would just like a little clarification on page six of seven, agenda item 13A, at the top, C, the renovation of Clubhouse 3 in a manner where it retains the use of its performing arts center. Does this mean then that um, the corporate members would not need to go on vote on it and that GRF could do this? That's what it means? That is not good, I don't think. That's why I said three items. No. To Manuel's point, I, I have three items, and to your point, Pat, that I'm going to suggest and request that these three items be moved up to requiring corporate member approval. Yes. And, and to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure the context of why that was included in the not section when mm -hmm. we can push it up to the approved section, the section requiring approval. So yes. I have that down. Good. Yep. A, B, and C? Yes. The second A, B, and C under paragraph four. Page 507. <clears throat> Director Armendariz. Thank you. That would mean with that change that uh, on the next page, a would be the renovation of the gatehouse, okay? The other three above it would move under E. Understood. Thank you. We have some requests to speak. All right. <clears throat> I call on Maxine McIntosh. Oh. I just not Maxine McIntosh, 68C. And thank you, legal counsel Jeffrey Beaumont, for clarifying the one item I was most concerned about, that we don't exclude one clubhouse from the others, uh, whether we call it PAC or clubhouse. Uh, I would like to see um, in 4D, when you refer to PAC, you say PAC and clubhouse, or and center for club meetings. Even one of the GR directors spelled out. She said, that's intended, but it wasn't written in there. She said, of course we wouldn't push out the club, house, the club meetings. Her, her words were, that's included, that there are club meetings at the PAC. Um, I appreciated Jeffrey Beaumont referring to the problem four years ago when there was a lot of turmoil here among uh, board members and GRF board members. The Housing Mutual Board members, not all of them, but the majority of them, were trying to get GRF to see that this recreation master plan with the $10 million loan and planned expenditures of many, many millions more was not in the best interest of the village, but there wasn't any bylaw at that time. We certainly need this bylaw and the changes. And so um, the corporate members, unfortunately, had to recall two board members from GRF. The, the vote was always six to five. I was one of the five at that time. And the vote was always six to five in favor of going ahead with all this spending, taking out the loan, et cetera. And uh, that was awfully close. So the corporate members finally chimed in and said, then we'll recall two of those board members and we'll place people on that board that will be more sensible. And I hate to see corporate members have to go to that point. And it takes time to go through it all and it's expensive. So we certainly need clarification. Um, listed under the words, shall not require corporate member approval. Uh, I don't know why we need to make an exception with this boardroom. 
if uh, there was a plan in the future to spend more than half a million on up to maybe several millions on this boardroom, why not have corporate approval? That's a lot of money to spend on one big room. I would put that back in and not have an exception. And the other one that concerns me is the equipment at restaurant 19. I've lost the figure now, I should have asked uh, Mary, on how much money we're losing on restaurant 19 every month, how much money it costs us mm -hmm. by legally following their um, contract. But to exclude, if we buy a new, if, if um, new equipment is bought for product 19, why shouldn't it come under the scrutiny of you people, of the board members who That's represent all of us here that paid the bills? Yeah, it should come under your control. That should not be an exclusion. Please get those out of the exclusions. This boardroom and uh, the equipment at restaurant 19. Uh, maybe accidentally, but this document is attempting to impose a small vote on expenditures that should come before all 20, what is it, 25 of you all together. All right, Maxine, your time is up. And if Thank I you. may say, number one, we have already decided that we are going to take the A, B, and C, the meeting, the uh, uh, board meeting room, and the second floor, and the renovation of Clubhouse 3 out of this not be considered and put them into consideration. Oh. And what you're talking about as Club 19, nowhere does it talk about their equipment. It's the removal of the Club 19 restaurant completely and making Village Greens into only meeting rooms. No, so, under the exceptions, it says equipment, equipment at Restaurant 19. I'm so glad to hear you took the boardroom out. I missed that when trying to keep up with everything. But it does say. All right, was, I'm sorry. I I yeah. apologize. I'm looking at uh, the exclusions on page five, and you're looking at page seven. So thank you. Yes, <clears throat> and right. I hope one of you will uh, make that proposal. You know, make a motion that we uh, take. Uh, we're we're not going to make any motions here today. No. Jeff has already said he's taking it back to the attorneys who drafted this for GRF and they will bring us back a red-lined copy with the changes in it that we have suggested to the corporate members' meeting. We do not have that privilege as a board. We, are, we do as corporate members when we go to a corporate members' meeting, but as this board, all we can do is endorse this going forward so that it can be uh, discussed and uh, implemented okay. by the corporate This is members. so different from anything I experienced before. Thank you for clarifying for me. Okay. <clears throat> Maggie. Thank you. Just a small one. On, on the two uh, where there was a question about GRF's employees, agents, or invitees, it should be VMS, I believe, and they do use the facilities yeah. for uh, staff recognition parties and things like that, end of the year parties. So we don't want to say we won't let them use it. So we don't, I, I would leave that as it, as it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we have another request One to more speak. request to speak. Yes. Mary Stone. Yeah, I think Maggie, you were referring to uh, page five of seven. Number two, yes. that, that you're going to change that to not GRF employees, but to VMS employees? Yes. Okay, and that was similar to in section one on page four of seven, VMS employees. There was one other thing about um, GRF vehicles. Let's see, where was that? Uh, vehicles used by GRF for its agents. I don't believe GRF uses vehicles. That's on uh, page six of seven. seven. F. And that would be uh, number two, F. There's, that needs a little clarification there. And I, want, I also want to make sure that if you are going to be expanding a room, say if we took this room and expanded it out a uh, 1,000 feet, there would be questions to the corporate members regarding that because it's not exterior but an interior expansion, correct? Well, you could. Sorry. 
That would go under. I mean, we're, we're talking under, about under for the, that would be an expansion, and that it doesn't would be necessarily more. have to be an expansion so. out. It is uh, also within. within. Yes. Thank okay. you. All right, and uh, as to your one on F, um, the equipment, such as the vehicles, are owned by GRF, and therefore GRF and this one has to give permission for their agent, BMS employees, to use that equipment. And that's really what that's, that's for there. All right, if there are no more comments, uh, may I ask you to vote, please? We are voting to send this to the corporate members meeting with the red lines of the comments that we have made today. We can't approve it. Only the corporate members can approve it. All we can do is move it forward to them. All right. Well, yeah, as our attorney said, he has made all of those notes. We will redline it, bring it back to uh, to us to see what, or all the corporate members to see what changes we suggested. So we are voting without seeing the changes. Yes. We are voting on moving this item forward. with the suggested changes right. forward. Both. Uh, I'll, I'll interject if you don't. If you don't mind, let me. I'll try to simplify it. Um, let's talk practicality. This is going to be a ballot measure before the corporate members, whether in its form today or in a similar form based on our changes today, reflecting all of our comments, or in a form reflecting some of our comments. I, I can't predict what form it's going to be before you. Um, when you're asked to vote on it as a corporate member, but it will be a ballot measure for you to vote on. Let, let's back up even further. Let's assume that I go back to the attorneys and, and just put yourself in my shoes. I take all these good comments, all of which I'm supporting, and I go and, and coordinate my efforts with GRF's attorney, Third's attorney, and the Tower's attorney. And now I'm suggesting that these changes be incorporated. Now, to try to get three plus me, four lawyers on the same page, <laughs> we've been successful to date, but I can't give you any guarantees. I can tell you that a lot of these will be incorporated, if not all, but exactly what will be incorporated, I don't know. But what I can assure you is that by the time you get to that corporate member meeting, you'll know exactly which of these changes have been included before you even reach that meeting. So you'll be an informed corporate member as to what you'll be voting on. And you can vote yeah, your name. Between the difference of today's version and what that version will be on the ballot. I can tell you if I was in your shoes and you entered that boardroom and were asked to vote on it in its current form today, I would still vote yes. Only because it's a heck of a lot better mm -hmm now than it would be yesterday not having anything at all. But I'm telling you, I'm gonna do what I can to get all these changes in place. But, but worst case scenario, which I don't think it's even be an option, but let's say worst case scenario, it doesn't change at all. I'd still implore you to vote yes on it because it's a heck of a lot better than not having anything at all. Right. And we can always push after that meeting to make changes to this resolution, which is very easy by calling another corporate member meeting. Okay. One more comment. Uh, I thought according to Robert's rule, when you have an uh, amendment to a resolution request. No, no, no. These are. This is not an amendment. We have. I'm sorry. Well, this is what we recommended. Uh, if there's yeah. an amendment, we did we not need to vote on amendment. any of these. We will not vote on any of these because these are just recommendations that our directors put in and instructed our attorney to take back. And the finished item with or without uh, our suggestions will present, be presented to you as a corporate member. And then it is your right and responsibility to either vote yay or nay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we have one. Oh. All right, we have uh, 10 to, <clears throat> to 1, the motion passes. 
All right, we will go to 13B. And again, I call your attention to the <clears throat> supplemental material that was uh, put on your the dies here for you to, to read because uh, there were a few updates that were not there when the agenda package was made. But uh, I will ask our secretary to mm -hmm. read the resolution. I'm looking. Thanks. Resolution, uh, Supplemental Appropriation for Emergency Panel Replacements. Whereas the four meter main electric panels at building 765 and 766 were in need of replacement due to excessive corrosion and the structural integrity was compromised by rust, which affected the electrical components and the feeds, which interrupted power to several manors in each of these buildings. And whereas the cost to perform emergency repairs at two buildings was charged to the 2018 reserves plan for electrical systems. However, this funding is required for scheduled program work. Now, therefore, be it resolved on September 11, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby ratifies the expenditure and authorizes a supplemental amount appropriation in the amount of $48,000 from the Replacement Reserve Fund for Emergency Electric Panel Replacements at Buildings 765 and 766, and further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Is there a second? <clears throat> John? Mm. All right. And I would call your attention to our regular uh, agenda package, which has the pictures that show these particular panels and why this is needed. <clears throat> Discussion? Cash? This, this particular building had some uh, alterations done without permits. Uh, and we had this issue last year. Does this, these pictures to me indicate that there's more than just uh, damage by weathering? Was that uh, verified that this was not because of the alterations? Yeah. Madam President, uh, board members, uh, this uh, panel is being replaced strictly because of its age and the condition of it, which is the result of being exposed to excessive moisture. Uh, it does not have anything to do with uh, man alterations. <clears throat> Jamie? And as to have a question, <clears throat> are we aware of any other panels in this situation? Um, have we done any inspections or do we just find these by landscape might recognize or how do we find out and do we have the possibility of more? Uh, there, there is possibility of more of these panels. We, do, we don't have a proactive uh, program to actually go out there and inspect them on a, on a regular basis. However, we do have many eyes on all of our infrastructure by our inspectors that are out there doing the paving, the landscapers, the painting crews. So, uh, so it negates the necessity for a formal inspection program because we were out there constantly. Uh, we try to push, obviously, our infrastructure to the limit, you know, to uh, get the most out of it. Sometimes it, we just have to bite the bullet and, and make some uh, uh, improvements. This happens to be one of them. But unfortunately, a lot of our panels were installed uh, in conditions that are, uh, that do not preclude moisture from actually hitting them uh, regularly <laughs> or uh, being in, a, in, a, in an environment that is excessively humid. Um, so obviously when we replace this panel, it will be put on a pedestal, it will be put high up, uh, and the materials, of course, will be much, much better than what we currently have. So we don't see this happening in, you know, uh, in a long, long time with this particular panel, but we do go out there and, and uh, through our regular other programs, we look at other things that are happening and we open tickets to make sure that they're working in, uh, in good condition and that are safe. Hopefully we can go ahead and work with landscape and be sure that the sprinkler systems aren't hitting these panels 
So we have this type of situation. We do. We do. We do divert the water, make sure it's not hitting anything that's metal. Uh, but nonetheless, the panel is was located right on the ground. Um, and whether you divert the sprinklers or not, that's a humid location. And it's a very, very old panel. It's an original panel. So, but we do work with landscaping to make sure that uh, we preclude water actually hitting our metal uh, uh, panels and boxes. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> And I just might mention that if you look in the resolution, one of the ways we find these, Director Durrell, is interrupted power to manners. When they call in with interrupted power, then we can go out and look at individuals. If they're not having problems, it's not something we do on a regular basis. Director Basami? I have a question from China. Are these panels, main panels, by us or by Edison? No, these are our panels. We own these panels. Uh, so in this, old buildings, right? That's correct. Yeah, this is this is after the meter. So before the meter, it's all Edison infrastructure. And if there were any problems uh, with that, we would defer to Edison to address. But anything past the meter belongs to us. But the meter is on these panels as well, isn't it? That is that is correct, and it's considered just as it would. Uh, on any home outside of our walls, that could be your panel. So you own that panel, uh, even though the meter is located right on that panel. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Director Tarn. Uh, I'm seeing the, uh, the statement, the resolution statement here, that mentioned electric panel and electrical systems and emergency repairs and this type of uh, statement. So I don't know why is it an emergency panel? I think we have an emergency repair, but this is not, a, is it an re emergency panel or is it an electrical panel? I would like to clarify that. I, I would think that cha maybe change the wording of the resolution to supplemental appropriation for electrical panel replacement rather than emergency panel. I don't understand why it's an emergency panel. Emergency replacement of a yeah, panel. Yeah, emergency replacement. <laughs> Everything is emergency. I understand that. But that's the action. That's not the purpose of this panel. This purpose is not an emergency panel. Is it an emergency panel for some emergency panel? No, it's, it says emergency electrical panel replacement. So you have to, there's no comma there. Yeah. So it's an emergency replacement. So, so emergency replacement, but not emergency panel. Is this is not for emergency? Purpose. There's no it's, such thing as an emergency panel. Right. So why do we have an emergency no. panel on that? It's, no, it, it's, it's emergency. It's, panel. You have to read the whole. All right. All right. Paragraph. Enough. I, uh, <clears throat> Director English. I don't believe we've had a motion on this yet. Is yes, that we correct? have. Yes, we, we have. have? Okay. By Maggie and seconded by Don. Okay. Thank you. Did you? Was there, all right. Uh, let's vote. Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, the next item is C. Entertain a motion to approve supplemental appropriation for emergency paving repairs. <laughs> These are paving repairs that are a, an emergency, they are not emergency paving. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just want to bring up to your attention that there's a correction that needs to be made to this, uh, both in the report as well as the resolution. Uh, this is a similar item uh, as the one that you just heard and voted on. Uh, the supplemental appropriation should be from the replacement reserve fund, not the contingency fund. So I would like to make that uh, change on the report as well as in the resolution. So uh, the last... Uh, it is uh, in the new one that we got. Oh, it is in the new... Yes. So, mm -hmm. Very good. So I want to make sure that... You that, did get uh, that correction in. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, supplemental appropriation for emergency paving work. We're asking July the asphalt... 
overlay work commenced in cul-de-sac 38, and during the pavement milling operation, the pavement structural section failed and the significant deflect deflections were experienced due to existing poor subgrade conditions over a large portion of the cul-de-sac area. Whereas this unplanned work was expedited to allow residents access to their respective parking places, and whereas the 2018 business plan included funding for the annual paving and concrete repair programs, but contingency funding was not appropriated this fiscal year <clears throat> in the event of unplanned paving failures. Now, therefore, be it resolved, <clears throat> on September 11, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby ratifies the expenditure and authorizes a supplemental <laughs> appropriation in the amount of $114,246 from the replacement fund for full depth emergency paving repairs completed in cul-de-sac 38 and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Thank you, John. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the supplemental appropriation for emergency paving work. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. unanimous this resolution passes all right we go to 13 D entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for revisions to the architectural standard 17 patio gates and courtyards this will require a 30-day member review to comply with civil code would you read the <coughs> resolution, please? Revise alteration standard 17 patio gates and courtyard doors. Whereas the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend alteration standards and create new alteration standards as necessary, and whereas the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee recognizes the need to revise alteration standard 17 patio gates and courtyard doors. Now, therefore, be it resolved September 11, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces the revisions to Alteration Standard 17, patio gates and courtyard doors attached as part of the official minutes of this meeting. Resolved further that Resolution 010762, adopted June 2007, is hereby superseded and canceled and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written. I move this resolution. Second, Jamie. It's been moved and seconded that <clears throat> we approve the uh, revised alteration standard 17, patio gates and courtyard doors. Any discussion? Seeing none, I ask you to vote. is 10 to 1. And we will go to item E, which is to introduce a resolution for revisions to architectural standard 18, gutters and downspouts. This also requires a 30-day notification. So what we are voting on is to put it through. It would be to our November meeting. Revise Alteration Standard 18 Gutters and Downspouts. Whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend alteration standards and create new alteration standards as necessary, 
And whereas the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee recognizes the need to revise alteration standard 18, gutters and downspouts, now therefore it be resolved September 11, 2018 that the Board of Directors of this corporation here introduces the revisions of alteration standard 18, gutters and downspouts, attached as part of the official minutes of this meeting, Resolve further that Resolution 01-10-224, adopted October 2010, is hereby superseded and canceled, and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written. I move this resolution. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat. It's been moved by Maggie and seconded by Pat that we approve the <clears throat> revised alteration standard 18. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask none, I'll ask you to vote. Okay. I have a question. All right. <clears throat> 2.3 on this alteration. Uh, it says if the alteration gutter system must be connected to an original steel gutter system, the member is responsible for replacing the original steel gutter system. Why? Because if it's not connected originally, uh, why would now the member be responsible? If it must be connected, then they're responsible. Yeah, but it's not connected already. Right. But if there's a reason why it needs to be, this says then it's but the, the member But the reason has to be specified. No, there are many different reasons, Director. We voted on All it. right, uh, <clears throat> I need two more votes. Director Tibbetts, uh, can I get your verbal vote, please? Just give it to him for her verbally. Yes yep. or no? All right. <clears throat> the motion passes 10 to 1. And we will go on to 13F. Entertain a motion to introduce a resolution to revisions of architectural standard 43 bathroom splits. This again requires a 30 day. Uh, and so it must be post. We're voting to move it to our next business meeting, which would be in November. Would you read the resolution, please? Revise alteration standard 43 bathroom splits, whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend alteration standards and create new alteration standards as necessary, and whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to revise alteration standard 43 bathroom splits, now, therefore, it be resolved September 11, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces revisions to alteration standard 43 bathroom splits attached as part of the official minutes of this meeting. Resolve further that resolution 01-1826, adopted February 2018, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written. I move this resolution. Okay. Do I have a second? Thank you, Pat. Any discussion? Hmm? Yeah. Yes, Raisa? I have a comment here. On 2.5, they have included the plumbing plans, but not the electrical plans. And I think it's necessary, otherwise this standard will not be complete. Okay. Uh, I do bring to your attention that there's only three models that this applies to, Granada, <coughs> Valencia, and Barcelona, that have situations that aren't addressed in the, in the rest of the standard. Yes, but <coughs> there's, if you move walls, uh, Renita, if you move walls, you're moving receptacles, lights, and other things. 
So the electrical plants has to reflect that. Otherwise, we won't know where the wires are, where the, uh, where the other electrical infrastructure is. All right, so you are, uh, Kurt. <clears throat> asked, oh, Kurt, would you address that for us? Thank you. Um, electrical plans would be addressed at the city level when they apply for a city permit. On electrical plans of this scope, they would only show schematic, show where the outlets are and the lights are, and that you can see from inside the unit. So they have no real value to us as a mutual. Yeah, they may not have real value, but you won't know where the things have been moved from what, where to where. So you don't know where the wires are, you can't drill on it, and it will be a hazard. So I have referred, I have, said this several times in the committee, but it's been ignored. So I'm now uh, saying it again to be recorded on this. I think this is important uh, issue. And you guys are not listening to what I've been saying. We added the plumbing conditions at your request. That was one of them. Plumbing and electrical were both. I agree, I appreciate you added the plumbing plans, which was useful, but the electrical hasn't been added. We can address that when we address the special conditions on a going forward basis. I don't know. All right, I think uh, Director Desai, would you like to make an amendment that we add in 2.5, including plumbing and electrical plans? Yes. <clears throat> Do I have a second to that amendment? I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is a city issue, but if he wants it in our standard to make it more clear, that's his that right. All right, let's vote on the amendment to. <sighs> yes. Uh, on 2.5, I understand that we want to add uh, uh, plumbing and electrical plans. It also mentioned that uh, these plans shall include. Uh, pipe penetrations, location plumbing connections, and events pipe size and types. What are the electrical concerns that uh, 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 Director Bastani has about specifically? Do you want to include anything in there? Or should we uh, ask, the, uh, um, ask the staff to elaborate on that? Are you talking to me? Yes, yes. Director. <coughs> yeah, I think the, uh, the, the thing, uh, at 2.5, the concept has to change. Now, the wording, I'm not sure how they want to reword it, but they have to reword it. Yes, so, so maybe we can get uh, Kurt to uh, give us some insight of what are the uh, includes things that we need to put in there, or should we just, uh, what, what should we do on that? You're the expert on that. <coughs> Electrical plans also show the wiring uh, going from one knot to another. So that's also important to be added. But uh, uh, that's all. <clears throat> yes, Director. Thank you. Uh, with the advent of the uh, lining of the pipes with the epoxies, when you convert such a unit that already has the pipes relined, to, from one bathroom to two bathroom, we need to make some provision for the additional pipe connection uh, that might be uh, detrimental to the inside. <coughs> uh, that will show I, on the piping I? plans anyway. Yes, they will. The additions. Might I suggest that both these recommendations are valid but they should be added to the general conditions that apply to all mutual consents, not just this one. Okay. All right, I have a motion on the floor uh, <clears throat> that we amend this to add electrical plans to 2.5. Uh, <clears throat> and I call for the vote.
All right, the it, motion, the amendment passes <clears throat> 10 to one, and now we will vote on the original motion uh, to introduce revisions to standard 43 bathroom splits. If you would vote, please. Mm -hmm. This would be as amended. <clears throat> I'm missing one. Are you voting in favor of this motion? All right, it passes <clears throat> unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, the next item is, <clears throat> excuse me, G. Entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for revised interior flooring policy. Would you read the resolution, please, Madam Secretary? Interior flooring policy. Whereas the installation of replacement flooring in units situated on a building level directly over another unit's, the unit's apostrophe S, I guess, Another unit's living space has generated nuisance complaints to the mutual related to noise transmitted to the lower neighboring units when members have replaced original flooring types with alternate flooring materials. Whereas the United Laguna Woods mutual, sorry, whereas the United Laguna Woods mutual occupancy agreement requires that a member shall not obstruct or interfere with the rights of other members or annoy them by unreasonable noise. And legal counsel has previously opined that the mutual has the authority to establish rational rules to regulate unreasonable noise. Whereas on May 13, 2014, the Board of Directors adopted Resolution 01-1458 which prohibited any future installation of hard surface flooring on second floor units in areas other than the kitchen and bathrooms of units, whereas 01-1458 defined hard surface flooring as any flooring other than original flooring types of carpet, vinyl, or linoleum, and whereas due to the advances in soundproofing underlayment technology and the continued popularity and value of installing hardwood style and laminate floors, now therefore be it resolved September 11, 2018, the Board of Directors hereby introduces the interior flooring policy attached to the official minutes of this meeting to further define and regulate permitted flooring types. Resolve further, the mutual shall permit the installation of alternate flooring materials other than the original flooring types, <clears throat> provided the materials meet the sound transmission specifications in the attached policy. Resolve further the installation of flooring types other than carpet with padding in any area of the unit with living space of a separate residence below it shall meet the requirements of the policy. Resolve further living space shall be defined as any area within a unit that is not a bathroom or kitchen. Resolve further that resolution 011458 adopted May 13, 2014 is hereby superseded and canceled, and resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Do I have a second? Janie. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we <clears throat> approve the uh, new interior flooring policy uh, discussion. <clears throat> Director Akrakar. The last architecture committee, I'm talking about page 5 of 8, 13G. Mm -hmm. Item 1.2, we had agreed to change the uh, insulation class to rating of 60. And here I still see the number 50. Thank you. We'll make that change. 
Any other, Jamie? I just wanted to clarify that, that if I remember correctly, Kurt, when you go into a retail store, and a lot of these are uh, graded now, and if we look at 60, when <coughs> 60 is actually installed, the sound rating comes down to a 50. Is that correct? That's why we have the 50 in here. Should be the 60, I agree with you. We but <clears throat> so you purchase a 60, but when it's installed, it's a it, it really is tested at 50. Is that correct? To answer, um, Director, I don't have to say your last name. Cash. Uh, cash. Um, it does say 60 in the first paragraph. We're going to require the installations of materials to meet a laboratory testing of 60, which in turn, once installed, we will accept a 50, which is code. So we're trying to encourage them to get at least a 60, so when it is installed, we'll be at least a All right. Uh, Take my question. <coughs> Carl? Oh, I'm sorry. Cash, you weren't finished? OK. Carl? <clears throat> due, to the, due to the sensitivity of this issue within the community, OK, with the interior flooring and hardwood floors, I'd like to ask the question that when the resolve further it says resolution 011458 adopted May 13 is hereby superseded and canceled. I don't believe it was the intent that we went when we went to the architectural committee meeting that we were going to tell those people that are currently grandfathered in because they follow the rules baked before 2011 that they need to meet this requirement today. And that was my concern, because when you say you cancel this, does that mean right now that the people that are currently grandfathered in, are they still grandfathered in? I just want to make sure that that's the case, OK? Is that the case, uh, Kurt? So they're still grandfathered in, so that that hasn't changed that. So when we canceled and superseded the other one, that didn't abandon the 2011 people. Thank you. Gary? It's my recollection at the architectural meeting that we voted for a 50 rather than a 60 because it was code. And uh, that's, I can remember doing that. Any other comments? We have a request to speak. OK. Uh, Dick Grader. You're going to do it, not Brenda? <laughs> Unfortunately, Brenda wanted to make the comments, and uh, we have a water intrusion issue. So I'm going to read what she would have conveyed to you. I would like the board to consider sending the proposed resolution back to committee so they can address the issues I'm about to raise. I realize that the sound insulation rating has been increased to 60 instead of 50. However, these ratings were done under laboratory conditions, not in real buildings. So I'd like to know if we have tested 60 rated flooring in some of our buildings, because as you know, differences in construction may affect sound transmission. Based on the results, we may need to increase the sound insulation rating. Another point, according to staff, hard service flooring that was grandfathered in uh, does not have to be replaced. However, there's Article 5 of the Occupancy Agreement states that a member should not be subject to unreasonable noises. It's important to know which rule takes precedence. I also suggest we ask our lawyer, the board can require replacement of grandfathered flooring if mediation between the neighbors does not resolve the noise problem and the flooring does not meet the proposed new regulations. If the answer is no, does our staff have sufficient records so they can determine which floors have been grandfathered in? We cannot depend on residents as there are many examples where this would be difficult if not impossible. One example I know of, prior owners are deceased and the current resident has no knowledge of when the installation occurred. I believe it's important that a prospective buyer, whether for an upstairs or downstairs unit, should be informed of the possible consequences if the unit they are considering has hard surface flooring. This is because the upstairs person needs to know 
um, before purchase that they could potentially have to replace their flooring if it does not need, meet proposed sound specifications. Also, a person may decide not to buy a particular lower unit if the upper unit has hard surface flooring, especially if that flooring has been grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. Today's resolution requires that an occupant must file a noise report before action can be taken. But this procedure is problematic because the proposed resolution has an inherent bias against first floor residents. That bias would make them hesitant to report excessive upper floor noise. For example, a resident may be fearful of retaliation by the upstairs neighbor, especially if that person is required to replace their flooring. In addition, it costs $3,000 if testing of the upper flooring is required to see if it meets our new specs. Knowing that there is a possibility that they may have to pay that $3,000, this would probably prevent individuals with limited income from reporting excessive noise. The resolution does state that assessment of this fee is up to the board, but there are no guarantees. In closing, I'm asking the board to send this resolution back to the committee, as I'm sure that further discussion will elicit new solutions that will be fairer to the most number of people. Thank you. That's what Brenda wanted to say. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Gary? I have a reply to that. Um, the old rule of law is let the buyer beware. And um, I think we all buy our, our manners, units, with that in mind. I bought mine on the second floor because I didn't want to have anyone over the top of me. And um, Otherwise, I may have, I, I would have, well, and if I have to buy something else, it'll be a one floor. But anyway, um, I'm not sure, and I have uh, vinyl on mine, and I can't even live on carpet. And that's why I went in there, because I have, I have extreme allergies to dust. So I, they tell me not to, to have carpeting. So, I mean, everyone, it's a different instance in every case, and uh, I'm not sure you can regulate it. And as I said, it's let the buyer beware. It's everybody needs to do their own checking. Maggie? Thank you. Um, a change is made. The change is made by the upper floor person. The units as constructed are constructed in a certain way. The downstairs person buys in, and the upstairs person buys in, either before or after each other. The downstairs one buys in, he buys into a unit that is quiet because they've got carpet up there. Someone replaces it with a hardwood floor, you have destroyed his occupancy. You have destroyed his ability to sell. If you do not regulate this very gently and carefully, you reward the changer over the, the person who was originally there. That's a point. And this is, this is unfair. This is not equitable. If there is a process by which we could deal with these issues, I would love it. But just to say, well, it tests like this in the store, that offers me very little comfort. You are making a change to someone else's unit, in fact. And I don't think that's what should be done. So I think we need to err on the side of extreme caution here. I do think grandfathering in just allows someone who wildly put in whatever floor they wanted over a deaf person, or perhaps a dead person, and when the, per when, the, when the next person comes in and says, whoa, I had no idea, then they're stuck. So I don't see, I don't see this as being any fairness to the lower one, unless there is our usual procedure of going through compliance and saying this is too noisy, and I do like that procedure, and I think they should do the testing and so on and so on. But I think we need to err on the side of caution here. If the difference between 
60 is guaranteed to be no more than 50 inside when installed, that's fine. If it could be 53, that's not fine. Thank you. Gary. I just want to say when these buildings were built, they had upstairs tile floors. And I don't know whether you knew that, but when I pulled the carpet up to replace the carpet in the bedrooms, because they would not allow me to do alternate flooring, it has tile on the floor that were, I was not allowed to take up because it's asbestos ridden. So, you know, at what point are, are we saying you can and you can't make these changes? Right, the original floorings were carpet, vinyl, or yes. linoleum. It's so there were two hard surfaces already there. Not tile. Not tile. Right. That was an alteration done by someone. <clears throat> not necessarily. <clears throat> Raisa? I have a suggestion. <clears throat> uh, over here, we don't talk about the ground floor at all. Those who are on the ground floor do not need to satisfy any requirement, right? They can change it. Why don't we put it in here? Because there's ambiguity. Well, the first that whereas seems... addresses that. What? Directly over another <coughs> unit. That's all. They have to be over no, another. No, I'm, I'm talking about the ground floor. Yeah, well, they don't. They don't. this says it only applies to second floor. Mm -hmm. Carrie? I just want to say that I'm very willing to have the corporation buy my unit, and I will buy a one floor somewhere else. <laughs> don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Janie? Kurt, could you come up and explain to us how we do the testing for sound if there's a conflict between the neighbors? We discussed this. I, I hate to put you on the spot. We discussed this at the committee meeting. <laughs> the theory behind this um, gr grievance procedure is a similar to the same one that third has used successfully for the last half decade um, with very good success. Um, it is based upon the person downstairs complaining about the noise upstairs that meets those questions. Um, and it's a meet and confer is the first process. So the person downstairs complains they don't like the amount of sound coming from the newly installed floors. They meet and confer and see if they can work it out for themselves. If they cannot, the onus falls on the person installing the floor. If the floor does not meet the ratings that it's supposed to be, it's their responsibility to go back to either the place they purchased or the person who installed it because they bought a floor that was supposed to meet a certain rating. And if it doesn't meet those ratings, it is the responsibility of the installer to make them, not the person who installed it. I mean, not the residents. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's where we're going at this. We're putting the onus on the person buying it in and the installer. Does that answer your question? Well, we're not talking about the ones that are already installed before no. 2010, when the first resolution was made. Right. The, the <coughs> first ones before that were grandfathered in that resolution. Right. And we yeah. identify them in the resale process. And we let the people know that there's hardwood flooring in there that whether it's grandfathered, we let them know it's grandfathered. If it's not grandfathered, we make them remove it in the resale oh, process. Okay, okay. Right, and okay. <clears throat> it, it is, um, you don't have to go to an, an owner or a former owner to find that out. It is documented in our system whenever somebody makes a major alteration like this so that we know where those okay. floors are. But I have to say, also, there are many people who, like Gary, are allergic to carpet or use a walker or something where a, a carpet is not good, and they specifically <coughs> buy a unit that has a hard surface floor. So uh, they don't install it themselves, but when they're out looking for a unit, they buy one that had already had that put in. <coughs> yes, Raisa? I have a, uh, also a suggestion and a question. There are instruments that they, uh, they measure sound. Mm -hmm. So if we use one of these instruments and quantify it, that so much level of sound is acceptable or not, then it will not be up to all this other 
issues, you know, so we can quantify. We, we use, there's an ASTM um, testing procedure. Yeah. We have a consultant on board that can do those tests for us. But we're going to save that as a last resort when there is an issue between residents. Yeah, but consultant charge money. I'm, what I'm saying, these instruments are cheap. We can get these. Uh, I mean, you have another instrument in your shop, in the plumbing shop, that they detect this uh, with acoustic noise down on the floor. You can use those, or if that is heavy, they're cheaper ones. That you can, you don't have to go to consultant for everything, which is expensive. I'll look into it. I'm not aware of this device you're talking about. Yeah, I've seen it. They came to my house. They used it because I was uh, sus on the ground floor. I was suspicious that there is a leak. They came over there and they uh, looked at it. They put on the floor and they looked and said, no, there is no leak. So, I mean, that was a little bit big about this big. Yeah in a plumbing shop. If you ask your plumbers, uh, I will. They, they will show you. you but there are cheaper ones. All right, Gary. I've got a question for Kurt. When they do these tests, so let's say they come into my unit, how do they determine the level of noise? There is a two part. There's a, um, a machine that has 12 hammers in it that each put off a diff different decibel rating. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a listening device that goes in the unit below that graphs the sound. And the, the, the unit up above is programmed to tap at a certain rate and a certain decibel rating. And then they read it downstairs and graph it. So the assumption is that somebody upstairs is wearing shoes. Correct. It's, it's based upon impact, different, different right. types of impact. And in my case, I don't allow shoes in the house. So that would be a little bit unfair also to use that test on me when I don't wear shoes. But you might use a walker someday. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it would be grandfather. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Pat? Um, yes, uh, I listened quite carefully to what Dick Rader just said. And my thought is this that we should go ahead, this is better than what we have already, so we should go ahead with this and improve it, knowing full well we're going to have problems, in my opinion, with grandfathering in. I think that's a very dangerous issue. And uh, so I would suggest that we go ahead and vote in favor of it and hopefully improve it as we go along. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Dick? I wonder. I, I thank the board for their comments, but I wonder if I could just uh, make a, a few additional comments. First of all, Kurt mentioned that um, you would have the right to go back to the manufacturer if it didn't pass the test. Actually, what would happen is this. The manufacturer has done lab testing. The installer took the manufacturer's product, which has a rating of 60. You have no recourse because if you go back to them and say, hey, it didn't pass the test, they're going to come back with their verified lab test, and that will pass in a court of law. You, the only thing that you can do is to, a Kurt would have to say, well, was it installed properly? And I discussed this with him. That's a pretty sticky issue to try and figure it out. But nobody here in this uh, request to send it back to committee, it does not say that you should use carpeting. Nobody said that. What we're saying is have, there's new material that's out there. It's relatively new. I don't know um, if these particular new materials have been tested in our buildings because, as I understand it, sound transmission depends on the structure of the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, And our buildings are not, let's say, the most sturdiest built. So that's what <coughs> one of the issues. Let's see if there was another one. Oh. And we asked, or Brenda was asking, if we get into a situation where somebody has grandfathered flooring and they are allowed to keep it, but the noise doesn't pass the, te the sound test, okay? Then you have to go to Article 5, which is the occupancy agreement that says excessive noise. Then you have to go to mediation, and the two have to try to resolve it. 
The question that I'd like to have answered is, or Brenda would like to have answered is, what happens if that mediation doesn't work? It's grandfathered hardwood flooring. The neighbor downstairs is still having the problem. What do you do then? Can you ask them to remove uh, or uh, the, the hardwood flooring? Mm -hmm. I'm asking the lawyer. Can yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> I, I've dealt with more of these um, sound <laughs> disputes between neighbors um, than I can count. I mean, this is, this is um, a very, very common issue. And at the end of the day, the board has to investigate each complaint on its face and make a determination as to whether there's a violation either by the um, upstairs resident uh, from a architectural standpoint, through objective verifiable evidence, or from a conduct standpoint, from an objective verifiable standpoint. And if the board makes a determination that based on the objective information before it, there's a violation, i.e. the occupants engaging in a nuisance, which is an unreasonable interference with somebody else's use and enjoyment of their home, then the board takes action to gain their compliance which can take many shapes and sizes. It can mean requiring them to take remedial measures and not wear shoes in their residence, uh, not use um, certain uh, types of furniture to put throw pads or, or rugs down, or to completely remove and replace their flooring with a different type of flooring. Um, so there's two issues. There's the architectural side of it, and there's a conduct side of it, both of which are just as relevant here. If you want to ask me a really good question, you ask me a question about whether um, the board has to take action when there's an upstairs owner with a legally defined disability that requires hard surface flooring and a lower resident that has a legally defined disability with respect to a sensitivity of noise. So you have two competing disabilities. And then you ask me that question, I just tell you, um, there'll be a lawsuit, we'll just refer it to your insurance company because there's no winner there. <laughs> Thank you. You answered the question in its completeness, and you also indicated that the board can take action if necessary to require a different floor service if mediation doesn't work. Thank you very Correct. much. Correct. So, yes, Gary. I've got another. This is for Jeff. <laughs> so let's say that I'm in viol noise violation, <laughs> and I pull my flooring up, and I buy a flooring that is rated at 60 or 70 or whatever, and I put it down. And I get a complaint from below, that a noise complaint. Whose responsibility is it at that point then to take it up or, or have it replaced? Or it seems to me like we're getting into a mess. We are, and that's why the, we can't talk about this in a vacuum, it's really specific on each case. Yeah. And the board has to look at the facts of each case and determine whether that person's conduct in that second floor unit rises to the level of a nuisance that justifies the board taking action and spending everybody else's money to resolve that one issue. Um, typically, it's, it, the standard is whether there's objectively verifiable information that shows that that occupant is engaging in a nuisance. If they're just using and enjoying their home like no other person, and there's no proof that that use and enjoyment is creating a nuisance, then the board backs off and says, if you still have problems, it's between you and your neighbor, not us. I was just gonna say, when mm -hmm. does it become a neighbor to neighbor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As with anything, there is usually no one size fits all. In these alteration standards, <clears throat> What we try to do is to have a general policy, and if there are exceptions to the policy, then they have to be brought forth as an exception and dealt with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I call for the vote, please. Sorry. Oh, Mary, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, Mary Stone, 356C. I think what you have to understand is your occupancy agreement trumps your resolution. And your occupancy agreement says that a member shall not obstruct or interfere with the rights of other members or, or annoy them with unreasonable noise. Now that trumps any of your resolutions. And so if, like, you, like Dick and I, we put in laminated floors when we had the second floor of a unit. 
The neighbor downstairs says, I love to hear you guys up there walking around because it lets me know there's somebody near. So she appreciated that laminate floor and liked to hear you know, that people were around. However, when Dick passed away, the unit was sold, whether they left the laminate floors or not. I do not like to hear you talk about grandfathering things in. It is not grandfathered in because your occupancy agreement trumps your grandfathering in because it says that you, you, you may not interfere in the rights of others with you know, unreasonable noise. So That's a subjective thing. What is excessive or unreasonable well, noise? Well, we also have legal things that specify what is and what is not reasonable noise. So I think that what you have to not put in here is that anything is grandfathered. Because as far as I can tell from this resolution, there's nothing grandfathered. So I think you have to understand that you must obey the occupancy agreement. I think that's, am I, am I mistaken? That's a governing document yeah, we can't that change supersedes that. a resolution. <clears throat> Correct. That's, that's interpretation. Cash? <clears throat> With what I'm hearing, more and more, why do we want to create one more paper by making this resolution? Because the, it's really not going to mean anything. We will have to go back and look at each case anyway. So why do we want we to We have a resolution in effect as of we, 2010 we already, that yes. says going forward, no one can, uh, on a second floor unit, put in a hard surface flooring. Right. Now we've had <clears throat> a lot of technical uh, improvements in the type of hard surfing floors. We're not always talking about hard wood. There are laminates that have cork backing. There's lots of different things. And so this is uh, trying to uh, say, instead of just a general, you can't do it, you have to meet these requirements in order to do it. Then maybe uh, we should add to this that uh, each and every case will still be determined on an individual basis. Does it say that? I think all of our resolutions have that understanding. Anybody can bring it back to the board with a, a, a complaint and ask for uh, looking at that individual situation. Pat? No, I, I'm pointing to these guys. Oh, uh, Carl I'm sorry. Answer. I'm well, <laughs> sure. Carl and then Raisa. OK. I just want to say that. Uh, the class of 50 that is in here is based on the California Building Code 1207.3 for new construction which requires that all flooring covering between living spaces must meet an impact insulation class of 50. We, when we put this together in the architectural committee, we said that we would ask them to purchase the ones that are 60, which makes it better, okay, and then it will meet the requirements of the 50, okay? So you basically try to, you know, you try to aim high, and then if you miss, okay, it just drops down a little bit, okay? So under the circumstances now, we're not, this number did not come out of, out of thin air. It came from the California Building Code for new construction. So if it's good for the California Building Code for new construction, it should be good for everybody. Now with regard to the grandfathering in, that's something, a horse of a different color, okay? But right now, for all the new floors, they have to meet this, they have to buy the 60 so that they can meet the 50. Thank you, Raisa. As I said before, uh, I think we have to quantify it because a reasonable noise is subjective. So it's different from one person to another. We have instruments to make the noise on the upper floor and instrument to measure the noise on the lower floor. So we can say this noise now made by the same machines is acceptable or not. And if somewhere it ex exceeds this, then we can say, no, this is too much or 
uh, is not enough, or it is enough. Anyhow, I think you have to subject uh, to quantify it. Otherwise, we'll go on arguing this thing. We, we do quantify it. it. Quantify. We quantify yeah. it as to the building code that it has to be 50. 50. Uh, yeah, but how do you <coughs> measure that? That's what I'm trying to say. That's what we just well, I believe. Huh? I believe Carl answered that. Well, uh, we could go arguing this all day. I'd like to ask you to vote, please. All right, the vote is 10 to 1, and the resolution passes. <coughs> all right. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we go down to 13H, which is a resolution banning residents from entering dumpsters. Would you please read that uh, resolution, Madam Secretary? I think, okay, I'll read it and then I'll suggest an amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas the Governing Documents Review Committee has recognized the need to establish a rule prohibiting the unauthorized removal of refuse and recyclable materials from United provided containers, whereas the mutual has determined that unauthorized access to materials placed in re refuse and recycle bins provided by the mutual is unsafe and may result in increased liability for the mutual, Whereas removing material from refuse and recycle bins provided by the mutual is illegal under California law. Now, therefore, be it resolved September 11, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces a rule prohibiting the unauthorized removal of refuse and recyclable materials from mutual provided containers in common area for use by residents and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move this resolution. Okay, may I, I second have a second? That. <coughs> Thank you. Is there any discussion on this? <coughs> Andre? <coughs> I'm for this uh, resolution, but I thought that there is a discussion that uh, uh, there is a reason that we want to do that. It's not described here is that anything in the dumpster belongs to the recycle waste management company and it's not uh, uh, our property. So it considered okay. stealing. Uh, so that's the reason. That's also the reason. I don't know if that's this, uh, described here. So people may not realize that they are stealing things. Right. Any other discussion? Yes, Carl. <clears throat> I believe there, besides the fact that it's against California state law, the intent here also is for our liability if somebody climbs into the bin, okay? One, he can get hurt or she can get hurt, okay? Or maybe contract some sort of a disease or what have you as a result of cutting themselves when, within a can, okay? And so under the circumstances right now, that's probably the major reason why we don't have people dumpster diving, if you will. Uh, but uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, it was mentioned within the staff report or what have you, that there would be a cost if we wanted to put up signs and what have you. And uh, in the last week or so, last two weeks actually, I'm in putting recyclables in my recyclable bin that's right close to my house, okay? I've opened the bin door and on occasion I've seen a chair in there, seen styrofoam in there. I've seen the plastic bags that we've asked people not to put in there. Uh, there are certain fines that we are assessed by WM, the exact number, and the number was 50... 5191. 5191, okay, per each bin, time, per, per bin every time they find something that's not supposed to be in there. So uh, based on that, uh, maybe not for this particular meeting or for another meeting, I think we should purchase large signs to make people aware of the fact that they shouldn't be dumpster diving because it's against the law and there's an issue of liability. And two, 
that they shouldn't be putting uh, refuse or anything other than these particular things in the recycle bins because this seems to be something that's never going to get resolved. And even with the sign, you're only going to get 50% of people that care. So, uh, but at least it gives us another opportunity to at least say that we've done something positive to possibly thwart this somehow, okay? Will it thwart it all? Never going to happen because people are as they are. They're people. Correct. And I, I just might mention that we have started putting signs on. They may not be big enough and they're there, but it, I know on my dumpsters now there are signs. And we're, we certainly are going to go forward with the a PR campaign as to what it's all about. Maggie? Yes, the difficulty is uh, some of the people are not jumping in for recyclables. They're jumping in to pull the trash out of the recycle bin and throw it into the garbage bin. And they're doing that as a, they think that's a good thing to help us out so that we don't have to pay the extra charges. And while theoretically that is a good thing, we cannot have them in the dumpsters. So, so do not be so urgent to, to save us some money. If I mean, my cul-de-sac has an F grade every week. Every day you can see, even once they start, we, we are graded F, I'm sure, every week for my, my cul-de-sac's dumpster. And, and it only, each layer has material in it that should not be in there, but there is nothing you can do. You cannot go in and pull it out. We can't have that. And signage is good, but, but I think there is a, a desire to disregard uh, with many people, and so we cannot control that. But for sure, we must keep the people out of the dumpsters, whatever their reason is, bless their hearts or not. They must not do it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no more comments, may I ask you to vote? Madam oh, President. I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, Maggie brought up a point. Uh, three, five, Mary Stone, 356C. Uh, in your now, therefore, be it resolved, the basically the last part of that sentence, and recyclable materials from mutual provided containers in common area, I think you should strike for use by residents. Because sometimes they're pulling out the newspapers to donate to other causes or things. So I think that it's important to, you know, it doesn't matter what the use is, you just don't want them to take anything for any reason. So I think you should strike that for use by residents. Well, selling it or giving it away for charity is a use by a resident. Well, I think that it doesn't. <laughs> they don't mean to be you take there. it in your home and use it. Yeah, I just think <clears throat> it doesn't. I mean, that's kind of you know making making a, a rationale there. I, I don't think you need any rationale. You want just no no excuses, no nothing. You just you're not allowed to take anything out. Right. All right, the suggestion's been made that we strike for use by residents and put a period after common area. That would be a Scribner's. Andre's name. <clears throat> Andre? Uh, yes, uh, to follow up on my, what I just uh, described, the stealing, I would like to add where us, when the contract grants the waste management company the ownership of anything in the container, uh, it constitutes a stealing and should be prohibited. Uh, so make sure that everybody understands that it's a stealing. That's a very important uh, uh, issue that we need to consider. Thank you. Illegal by state law. Right. <laughs> Maggie. I, I would strike in the fourth paragraph, the ne now therefore it be resolved. I would say hereby introduces a rule prohibiting the removal. Cross off unauthorized. There is no authorized purpose. Yep. <laughs> Okay, removal itself, that would be another yeah. scrimmage area. All right, are there any other comments? We have another request to speak. All right, Mary. Mary Wall. Mary Wall, 239D. Um, many years ago, we had uh, just the black bins and the regular trash bins. The black bins were for the newspapers and the trash bins for the trash. We made $60,000 a year on the newspapers. 
We don't have that anymore. What we have now are blue bins, and the blue bins were instigated by the city. The city makes the money on the blue bins, and we get the fine for not having the proper recycled in the blue bins. We also pay a franchise tax to waste management. Waste management also have a facility where they can separate all the recycle. So I don't understand why we're having blue bins. I would suggest that we go back to black bins with the newspapers and let waste management sort out the recycle. Plus the fact that the recycle, I know this doesn't, nobody likes this. They all want to recycle. Do you know how much water is being used to make the recycles clean so that it's acceptable? <laughs> and they're getting the profit, or profit if there's any profit, but the city is getting the money for all our recyclables and the franchise tax. The city has the can contract with waste management. We do not. I understand that. What kind of a contract do we have with the city? Do we have any agreement with mm -hmm. the city? Yes, we do. Is that available? Yes. Talk to Siobhan, I'm sure she would make that because available Because I've been down the city, I've been trying to get all this information because I want to know how much money is being collected by the city for the blue bins and how much, well, we don't know how much we are paying for all the, all the, rough, rough, the rubbish that's being put into them. And you're, with signs, 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 you can make as many signs as you like. We have a real problem in our cul-de-sac. We put signs, we tell people, and we still have the problem. Thank you. So where it goes. Okay, our next right, I call for the request vote. to speak oh, wait, is more. Maxine McIntosh. I moved up closer so I could get here faster. Um, wanted to further comment on Maggie and I sh uh, live near the same carport, and we both have tried everything we can think of to improve the situation by our dumpsters. And yet each uh, month when the truck comes around and picks up all the debris and stuff left outside there, it's a matter of two or three days, and it starts accumulating again. We've even asked neighbors, and, and I know I've especially asked a couple that live close by there, let us know if you see anyone doing that. So my suggestion is, in the rare cases like this one, this has been going all, over a year now, isn't it, Maggie? Yeah, in a situation like this, because staff has put up those signs. They've put up wonderful signs in two different areas, you know, close to where all the stuff's being dumped, on two different walls. It isn't stopping it. Could we have a camera put up in a situation like this where it, the signs don't matter, whatever the board decides to do doesn't seem to make a difference? In that case, could we have a camera installed and see if we can find out? Is it someone coming in from the outside in their truck at 3 o'clock in the morning and sneaking over there? Or is it actually a member of the community? And so maybe there could be a, a availability of a camera that could be installed for a while, for a couple of months, and see what we can <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dick Rader. <clears throat> Dick Rader, 270D. Um, what disciplinary action or fines do you have for somebody that is uh, inappropriately putting things in the dumpsters? They would be brought before the disciplinary committee, um, and we have a standard. Uh, matrix of fines uh, starting at, or going up if they keep doing it. So uh, we haven't called out specifically dumpster diving, but it would be a nuisance. So i there. All right, may we vote please? We are really behind mm -hmm. folks. And we have a very large closed session. So may I ask, we have three modifications, right? We have three modifications, right? Remove the unauthorized, remove for use by residents, and additional wear us for stealing. Is that no. what we're voting for? No. No, we didn't have stealing. We have so what are we voting for? <clears throat> Madam Secretary, we are, we are voting for um, the resolution as it by taking out the word unauthorized and right. for use by residents. Those are the two things that we are changing in I, this resolution. I thought when I mentioned uh, about stealing, everybody it's, agreed it's on no, that. No, it's, it's under the third whereas. Right. It's, 
illegal. illegal by California law. That means it's stealing. We don't have to specify. If we say it's illegal, it's illegal. <sighs> Director Armendariz. Right. It appears in the title, it appears in the first whereas, it appears in the second whereas, and then in the fourth, now therefore. Thank you. We're going to take it on in all those places, right? Thank you, yeah. yes. Director Amadeiras, can you give me your vote? Yes. All right, it passes unanimously. <clears throat> All right, uh, <clears throat> our last new business item is item I, a motion to approve the disciplinary violations matrix. And as a prelude to this, <clears throat> excuse me, we voted last time to bring forward <clears throat> to the meeting that we will be having on the 26th, <clears throat> the expanded definitions of what is a nuisance, what is clutter, what is harassment. <clears throat> uh, for the... Um, I don't have a pink slip for this. You know, we just have a copy of the, the matrix. It's an administrative procedure. It's not right. A, exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so we could just. That's why it doesn't need thirty days it. or anything like that. We it. just need to accept it. So, uh, would you vote to accept it? This will help the disciplinary committee and our residents. We published this in November with our big packet to say, okay, these are the disciplinary violations, and this is how we will handle them. I move that we accept this. <clears throat> Disciplinary violations matrix. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. <clears throat> uh, is there any discussion? If not, let's vote. J. Yeah, we did add 13J. So we do have one more. Right. <clears throat> All right, I still need two more votes. Right. Do you want to vote? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. All right. There you go. Hey. Okay, that's right. Who else are we missing? Carl. Carl is out. Oh, okay, he's up. All right, no problem. <clears throat> All right, uh, you have uh, item J. It's not in your packet. It is a separate item that was given to you. It was in your packet, but it's superseded. Right. Uh, and this is to entertain a motion to approve a resolution for early release of 2019 funds for the Wasteline Remediation Program. And basically, we have pushed and pushed our staff to get things done on the Wasteline Remediation Program, to go forward as fast as they can. Well, it turns out that they did that, and the funds that we appropriated for 2018 will run out the end of this month. But we appropriated quite a bit more money for 2019. So this is asking that we have early release of the 2019 funds so that we can continue this program instead of stopping it and then restarting it in January. Let's keep going, because they're doing a really good job. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to accept the early release of funds for the Wasteline Remediation Program? I move we accept the early release of 2019 funds okay. for the Wasteline Program. Okay, is there a program? second? Pat, all right. Discussion? Andre? 
Uh, usually, this <coughs> releasing the fund goes through the uh, finance department, uh, finance committee. Has finance committee approved this uh, process yet? Has uh, reviewed the whole process? Mm. We did not have a finance meeting, and this was an emergency that had to be taken care of. Mm. So, so it bypassed the finance committee at this point. Pardon? So it bypassed the uh, finance. Yes, committee it came directly point. here. Yeah. It's just like paving and the electric panels. You don't have the time to hash it through for a month. It is acceptable to bring it directly to the board if the treasurer, who's head of the finance committee, feels that it's appropriate. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Yes. It would take way too long mm -hmm. if we were to go back to the finance, and we've got everybody here, all the directors are here now, including the head of the finance committee. So it's appropriate that we go ahead and vote in favor of this. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I have a motion and a second to accept the early release of 2019 funds to continue the Wasteline Remediation Program. Uh, would you vote, please? Okay, I need one more vote. All right, it passes unanimously, thank you. All right, <clears throat> uh, on our agenda now we go to the committee reports and in the <clears throat> interest of time, I would last like to ask, well first of all, we will do the finance committee financial report as all, but the other committees, if you have not had a meeting or you have something particularly you want to bring to the uh, attention of the board and our residents, otherwise we will go through it very quickly. Uh, may we have the finance report, please, Gary? Okay, uh, slide one, please. Okay, the total revenue Maggie, for United, oh, I'm scary. sorry. Total revenue for United through July 31st, 2018 was 23,757,000 compared to expenses of 23,611,000 resulting in net revenue of 146,000. Page, um, slide two, please. Through July, United Mutual was better than budget by 639,000, primarily due to employee compensation and related due to vacant positions in maintenance. Staff is actively recruiting to fill these positions. Materials and supplies, it's a favorable variance due to a different manufacturer of water heaters being used in the community, more cost effective. Building structure replacement to date, only minimal work has been required. Landscape revitalization, the scope of work has not yet been determined. Water lines remediation work on buildings that qualify will begin in September. Slide three, please. On this pie chart, we show non-assessment revenues received to date of 925,000 by category, starting with the largest revenue generating category of interest income, followed by fees and charges to residents, laundry revenue, and so forth. Slide four, please. On this pie chart, we see the expenses to date of 23,611,000, showing that our largest categories of expense are for compensation and property taxes, followed by outside services, utilities, and so forth. Slide, slide five, please. Okay, the reserve balances on July 31st, 2018 were 22 million 938,000. The year-to-date contributions and interest to reserves were um, 7,159,000. 7, year-to-date expenditures were 6,653,000. Uh, our delinquencies as of 8-21-18 uh, our current month was 19, and that had a dollar value of 84,018. 
our prior month was 10, so we went up nine, and that value is $61,044, so it's up $22,974. Our chargeable services delinquency report went from 25 to 29, up four, so it went from uh, 60,910 to 66,201, so that's $5,291. Our resales year to date, 262 compared to 329 last year, so we're down 67 or 20%. Um, our sales volume was 72,792,640. Last year was 83,069,476, so it's down 10,276,836, or it's down 12%. Our monthly resale report, um, the sales volume for August is 11,440,100, our volume for a year ago was 11,310,367. So our difference is 129,733. So that our dollars are up, it's just our volume is down. Uh, our average resa resale price was uh, 278,698 and last year 251,369. So it's up 27,329 or it's up almost 11%. Uh, monthly leasing is 9%, so it's up about a percent from the previous month. Um, as far as uh, what we have been working on um, in the, the treasurer's part, uh, we've been working on budgets for a couple months and digging in line by line by line. Um, so that's uh, pretty much, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of the other things because we're running out of time. And, um, we have five liens to be recorded. We are funding for waistline remediation. We're working on moisture intrusion. We're funding for supply line remediation. The handyman program seems to be working well. Uh, electrical panel replacements, we still need to really get involved there. Flood buzz uh, was voted not to address and CPI or cost of living and tariffs. Um, we've addressed the cost of living somewhat in our budget. Uh, however, tariffs have not been. The GRF Finance Committee, um, basically, and I'm gonna do that so we get that out of the way right now. Um, same thing, we, we discussed tariffs and what the effects might be on the budgets to the actual because it's going to uh, as far as vehicles and everything else that they're buying, it can have a major effect on them. Um, supplemental funding for gate renovations and uh, supplemental funding for a community energy consultant. And there was a presentation by BlackRock uh, for investments. Thank you. Architectural control standards. Anything special? <laughs> yes, there is. Um, the alteration division is moving. And beginning the mid-October, the alteration division will be relocating from the Resident Services Center. Their new home will be in the northeast corner of the community center building in the room formerly known as the Spruce Roofs. Spruce Roofs. Spruce Roofs. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I was thinking of the Spruce Roofs. Anyway, the Spruce Roof. <laughs> The hours will be the same as the resident services from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. New signage will be installed in coordination with the move to guide red residents, contractors, and everybody else interested in um, going in and talking to the alterations department. 
The, the next meeting of the Architectural Control and Standard Committee will be held next week, Thursday, September 20th, in the Sycamore Room at 9.30. Thank you. Uh, anything on communication? I gave mine already for communication. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Executive hearings. Our next meeting is September 27th. <clears throat> Coming up, uh, governing documents. Our next meeting is September 26th. Uh, Landscape Committee, I think you had a couple of things. Yes, you to add uh, this is from the <coughs> Landscape Maintenance Manual, which was approved by the board May 8th, 2018. This is about hiring gardeners to do work. Uh, page three says, do not plant or alter or have your gardener plant, alter any common area. This includes slopes, clear areas around trees or in the lawn of the common area. These areas are not available for the yellow stake program or private maintenance. Uh, do not remove plantings without approval from the landscape division. Do not place materials in the common division. And there's one more. Well. Oh, yes, outside gardeners and private gardeners that perform work for members and shareholders within the community may not plant or prune any tree in a common area without the prior written approval of the Mutual Landscape Committee. So if you have a private gardener, keep him in your private area, your <coughs> staked area or your area right next to your home that you are uh, managing for yourself. Do not allow your private gardener to work, do anything in the common area. He may not um, apply fertilizers, pesticides. Only employees of contractors of VMS may access, alter, or operate our irrigation system, so he's not supposed to use any water. And we can't do any fertilizers or pesticides. Thank you. All right, uh, Maintenance and Construction Committee, Director Tibbetts, and just as a preview, we're going to miss you on that committee. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll mention a couple of items. Uh, waste lines, we have completed 118 as of this date, and thank you for increasing the funding. We ran out of money. <clears throat> Push panic panel update, we have completed 387 since it was started last year. Shepherd Crooks, it should be started the end of this month or early next month. And um, no, we discussed the lighting in the walkways. A lot of people have asked about that. And there's two, two uh, thoughts on that. There are people who are for it and people who are against it. Some say we have enough. You put too many in there, they, they'll shine in their bedroom. So we're still looking at it. We're going to ask the uh, electronic, con the electric Energy contract to be hired to make a better study for it. Uh, that, that's all. Thank you. All right. Anything on the energy task force, Carl? Yeah, energy task. The energy task force uh, met on August 1st, and on August 14th, I provided uh, an update of that, and our meeting. Next meeting is tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. in the Wooler Room, and it is an open meeting, so if anybody cares to attend, uh, right. thank you very much. Uh, anything from the Resident Advisory Committee, Director Tibbetts? <coughs> uh, we had no, sh no one attend this, this month, so we're doing all right. Okay. Well, <laughs> <coughs> I'd like to reiterate, the Resident Advisory Committee is like an abubsman. That is where if a resident has a problem that they want to talk about, <coughs> find solutions, everything, that's where you should come. Don't just suffer in silence. If you have a problem, bring it to the Resident Advisory Committee, and you will find people that will help you, and we can work with staff to help you too. So uh, it's a very important committee. I would like to suggest that we <coughs> not do GRF committee highlights in the interest of time. Uh, is there any, can I have a consensus on that? I just wanted to mention that uh, the CAC meeting is September 13th, which is this week at 1.30 in the boardroom. Okay. 
All right, let's go to uh, director comments. <clears throat> <clears throat> and since Director Armandiris has left the meeting, mm -hmm. we'll start with uh, Cash. Okay, Pat? No comments. Okay, Andre? Uh, no comments. Okay, Don? No comments. Amy? I'm going to make a, a couple of comments or a comment for a couple of our board members that we're going to be losing and missing. So I want to wish you good luck in your future <coughs> endeavors of what you're looking forward to and hope you come back to give us reports with GRF. Thank you very much. Maggie? You can't be replaced. We can just fill the seat somehow. Thank you. Gary? I want to thank you both for the time you have spent with us and helping us, and I've learned a lot from both of you, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Ray, sir? My second, James Conner. Okay. Carl? Yeah, I, I would like to that thank Pat and Don for their contribution to the board, even though I've only been here about six months, so, but thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to finish with two things. First of all, <clears throat> we have had a number of incidents over the last month or two of primarily moisture intrusion, although there has been other things, where our residents did not have insurance. I want to emphasize it's hard, it's the mutual has insurance only for the buildings, the outside. We do not cover anything inside, your flooring, your uh, that you've put in, any alterations that you've put in, and most of all, we do not cover loss of use. So if you are in a downstairs unit that has suffered because your upstairs neighbor has a leak and there's moisture intrusion and you have to get out of your unit for a few days while it's fixed, that's up to you. And you should have loss of use insurance. If you do not have insurance or loss of use insurance, please look into it because the uh, mutual does not cover it. And lastly, I would like to encourage everybody, please return your ballots, even if you do not vote for anybody. In order to have our um, <coughs> quorum of ballots returned, we need them returned. If you want to just vote for one person or all four, that's fine. And if you don't want to vote for anybody, that's all right, too. But please, it's a postage paid in envelope. Put them in there and get those ballots back. Thank you. All right, this meeting <clears throat> is recessed to the closed session.